Watch more programs like this on cable and stream with PCN Select. Subscribe at PCNTV.com. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to beautiful Cutstown University for our October quarterly board meeting. Um, Ken, I do want to, again, especially thank you for your hospitality, and we love being here. It's, uh, it really is a gorgeous campus, and once I got off the turnpike, a beautiful drive, too. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, let me begin by asking Audrey to please take roll call. Governor Aben Bittinger? Here. Representative Tim Briggs? Here. Governor Audrey Bronson? Here. Governor Nicole Dunlop? Here. Governor Alexander Fiefolt? Here. Governor Donald Hauser? Here. Senator Scott Martin? Here. Vice Chair David Mazur? Present. Governor Miriam Moskowitz? Governor Thomas Muller? Here. Secretary of Education Pedro Rivera? Designee Noe Ortega? Here. Representative Brad Roy? Here. Senator Judith Schwank? Here. Chair Cynthia Shapira? Here. Governor Samuel Smith? Here. Uh, Designee Allison Jones? Here. Governor Neil Weaver? Here. Governor Janet Yeomans? Here. Chairwoman, we have a quorum. Thank you very much, Audrey. Uh, and um, now I, I would ask everyone to please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, before we get into our agenda, um, I want to provide an opportunity for members of the public to speak. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to the board? Good afternoon, Dr. Mash. I never want to disappoint you, Jim. <laughs> you never do. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I was actually hoping that you, I didn't want to steal your thunder at all, uh, but uh, you know, for us, it is a bit of a historic moment to have one of our colleagues sit uh, with the board and to uh, be able to participate in the meetings. And I just want to personally say about Dr. Phillips, uh, what a great <coughs> choice he is. I've known him for, for many, many years and uh, greatly respect his intellect, uh, his drive, his love of his university, and for the state system and for his students. So I want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, for the initiative you took in, in making that happen, uh, as well as the Interim Faculty Council, as well, and in addition, uh, the Commission on Shared Governance. So thank you for that. And I'm not done thanking you yet. Um, you know, I, our uh, faculty contract is not yet complete. We don't yet have a tentative agreement, but I, I do want to take the opportunity uh, to thank you, uh, to thank the chancellor, and, and to thank every uh, one who participated from the system side uh, in our negotiations uh, so far. Uh, I just want to say that we just want to acknowledge because after so many years uh, that there was not an issue that we brought up that we didn't feel was taken seriously by the state system. And we may not have gotten what we would have liked to have seen, or it may not have gone as far as what we wanted to see happen, but we definitely appreciate that we had your ear, your patience, and your willingness to discuss things. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want, I never talk about uh, uh, my family personally when I'm up here, but I do want to say um, <clears throat> that uh, this morning I was up at uh, 4.45 a.m. Uh, to see my daughter um, take her oath and to join the Peace Corps uh, in Ukraine. Uh, my daughter is a proud graduate of Westchester University, 
and um, I'm immensely proud of her and what she is accomplishing right now, what she's done already, and what she is planning to do with her life. I did also just return to, I got here from being at a, a House Democratic Policy Committee hearing, uh, which was jointly held and bipartisan with members of the Student Debt Caucus. And I was fortunate enough, and I would encourage everyone on the board to, to not just talk to our students, but to also talk to our alumni. Uh, and I think only by talking to our alumni, and in this case, uh, there were two uh, Philadelphia school district teachers who talked you know, with high praise about their education at Westchester, but also about the crippling debt that they now face with the relatively low wage of being starting teachers. They're both about five years out along the way. And as I made the point there, and you know, I, I'm gonna beat this drum as long as I absolutely have to, uh, the root cause of the student debt problem, the reason why we are near the bottom, if not at the bottom, at every single indicator with regard to student debt, the root cause is that we don't properly fund this system. And until this system gets the support that it needs from the legislature and from the governor, student debt will continue to rise. Costs at our universities will continue to rise. I said last time that it was a, uh, you know, that we were kind of on board with the step of not increasing tuition this year, but that obviously creates uh, additional uh, fiscal pressures at our universities. We need to be able to articulate well to everyone who will listen in the Capitol building that this system needs additional dollars. I know that the, the chancellor um, has a plan uh, that the system, I hope, uh, you're gonna make a budget request um, I, I, I sincerely hope that it's not just a request, that the urgency is felt throughout the Commonwealth about the fact that we are not as affordable as what we should be. I, I listened to the private colleges at that hearing talking about how they are competitive or cheaper to attend than our universities are. Something is fundamentally wrong in this Commonwealth. And so we will do whatever we can to, to raise uh, our voices in the Capitol, but we need to be joined by everyone who has an interest in the state system in doing the same thing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mash. We are now gonna move uh, to the consent agenda, uh, which include past meeting minutes, um, updated committee assignments, uh, state system foundation recertification, uh, and the board meeting calendar. Um, are there any items that any board member wishes to be removed for separate consideration from the consent agenda? Okay, may I have a motion, I'll please? Move. Thank you, second? second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Um, okay, as we start to get uh, into our uh, the meat of our board meeting, um, I first want to do something that is very special to me, uh, which is acknowledge some new faces around the table. Um, first of all, this is the first official meeting for our three new uh, student governors, uh, including Nicole Dunlop from Slippery Rock and Alex Fiefel from IUP and Avon Binninger from SHIP. Thank you so much. We are so thrilled that you're here. Um, and we know that you will well represent the students' voice uh, and uh, also wear a system hat at the same time in all of these uh, deliberations. And welcome to you. And now for something completely different. Um, I am really, really delighted uh, to welcome uh, somebody else who is new to our table. And this is our first time ever 
faculty liaison to the Board of Governors, Dr. Jamie Phillips from Clarion University. Um, Dr. Phillips, your presence here uh, means so much, not only symbolically in, in terms of uh, where we have come and where we're going, uh, in terms of um, excellence and governance, but substantially too, as uh, the Board of Governors needs uh, a, a faculty voice uh, that is a bona fide uh, member of the group. So again, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to serve. I'll just say just a couple words about the process. So if, if anybody doesn't know um, how this occurred, um, to identify our first faculty liaison to the board, the faculty at each of our 14 universities held elections to choose a representative to sit on our new interim faculty council, uh, which is the, the, the first system-wide body of that type. The 14 members of the council then chose Jamie from among its ranks to serve as the faculty liaison to the board and as chair of the council. Um, and this council will continue to serve as an outstanding resource to the Faculty Shared Governance Commission, which we'll hear more about tomorrow, and for which um, uh, early on I will thank uh, Governor Don Hauser. Uh, Jamie, this is really a momentous time uh, for us uh, as a Board of Governors, and uh, I know we would all welcome it if you wanted to say just a few words. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I have to push it, I think, closer um, to you. I would start first by saying uh, I've been to a lot of meetings in my life, <coughs> or more than I would like to be, and this is probably the first one I'm actually genuinely excited to be at. Right? <laughs> so I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I did want to first off introduce, we have a couple members of the IFC that came just to this meeting, uh, Francisco Arlecon from IUP, Amanda Morse from Kutztown. Appreciate them very much. Uh, I am a, a product of a college education, right? and so I take this moment very seriously. I grew up very poor in Missouri. Um, I was a first-generation college student. Most of the members of my family didn't even graduate high school. I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force, and I had the GI Bill help pave my way through college. But if it had not been for the GI Bill, if it had not been for the council at the University of Missouri setting low fees, setting keeping tuition low, I would not have been able to afford college and my life would have been significantly different. Right? I'm married to a wonderful woman. I've got two sets of twins. Right? My twin daughters go to Clarion. They're both um, molecular biology majors. My life was transformed because some people in a room decided to help other people out, and that is who you are. Right? So I get to help students out every single day of my life, and it is my task in life to do that. I take great pride in it. Every time I see a student succeed, I feel like I'm doing my job, and I keep track of them and have done so for the last 20 years I've been at Clarion. I'm still friends with every single one of them in some fashion, and I keep track of how they're doing, and I get to help them, and every time I get to help them, I feel like I'm serving the purpose that I have, and this board is another mechanism by which to help people. We have great students. We have students that are poor and middle class, freshman transfer students, we have adult learners, all these individuals need the help of the Commonwealth to be successful in life and to achieve the American dream. And I'm happy and delighted and honored beyond. I can possibly say that you've given me this opportunity to be here today. So I want to thank the chair, I want to thank the chancellor, I want to thank the board. I will try to do my best to, to make uh, my uh, service here appropriate and make my service successful and to give you any good advice that I possibly can. Thank you very much. Thank you again uh, very much. Clear, clearly you have um, the character and the attributes and the experience um, and the intelligence uh, that will be um, uh, really valuable to all of us and we appreciate it. Um, so here we are um, a year later from the time when we were at our October board meeting in 2018, and I introduced Dan. Uh, and I, that was at SHIP, right? Was our meeting at SHIP? Was that IUP? Can't remember. It was that IUP. That's right. Thank you for that correction. And you beautifully hosted it, Mike. Thank you. Close. Thank you again. Um, uh, at the time, Dan prefaced every single sentence by telling us how many days he had been on board, <laughs> if you recall, every meeting he went to. Well, I've been on board for seven days now, and 
Um, after that meeting, he could, he really couldn't get away with that much, much longer. Uh, we launched in. Um, I, I think Dan hiring you was um, a transformative uh, decision um, in in saying that we were all in on redesign and all in uh, to make this system uh, great and to to serve our students and the Commonwealth. Um, and you, we knew, would be the catalyst for change. And we also knew that you would do it at lightning speed. Um, and we knew what had to come in that year ahead, and certainly even more so, I think, going forward, would not be easy. Uh, we are undergoing no less than a complete cultural change, not to mention uh, a, a new way of doing business um, and truly coming into uh, the 21st century. Um, we knew that there was a lot of baggage, a lot of memories, um, that there needed to be lots of uncomfortable conversations, uh, difficult decisions to be made by this board, um, by the chancellors, uh, by the presidents. Um, but we knew uh, that all of our stakeholders, and particularly our students, depended on us to do the right thing. Um, it's just too important. It has to be done, and it has to be done well. Uh, we got to work, and indeed, um, it's, it's been challenging, but it is moving forward. And we're coming to points um, now in, in the timeline where we're, we're moving from conceptual and sort of get, you know, getting consensus and confirmation around conceptual ideas, for example, moving to a sharing system, um, to figuring out how we put that into reality. And that's where the difficult, you know, that's, I'll use the, plenty of platitudes, the rubber meets the road. Um, but the, the, this is where we are at this point, And this is where we have to, uh, we have to move forward from at this point. We have done our best. I know we haven't been perfect. Um, Dan, I think, has been amazing around this to be inclusive and collaborative and transparent, um, but always moving forward. So just as, you know, kind of briefly, uh, what have we done in the past 12 months? Um, we defined a vision called a sharing system uh, that we felt was not only a business model um, that had uh, enormous potential moving forward, but that would be the best that we could be for our students. We did more than define the vision. We actually defined what we meant by that. And we actually put into place timelines and measures to see if we were successful in implementing this along the way. And that also included metrics that we uh, wanted to meet. And that also included discussions about um, setting real tangible goals uh, at the chancellor's level um, and then at the university levels. And we talked about how this model uh, also had to include being accountable. Um, that was hugely important. And at the same time, uh, we, we really did a lot of rethinking about our own governance structure um, and the accountabilities um, that, that, uh, that go along with that. Uh, and I, I think, uh, Don, uh, you've done tremendous work with this and uh, working with Jeff Smith with the PACT um, and with so many other people. Um, we're going to talk about uh, where we are with that and how we really are transforming governance and leadership. Um, to me, having come in uh, a month or two before the strike um, three years ago, uh, one of the most important things to me uh, was to completely reboot our relationship with our faculty um, as represented by our faculty union and to never again be in a position um, where we were arguing uh, over uh, who would compromise on what line uh, in the collective bargaining agreement, but to look at it instead as a collection of shared interests and what the best strategies were to getting to those shared interests. By the way, the shared interests always putting the students first. Um, one of the things we did uh, that was a more tangible step was to freeze tuition. And uh, Dr. Mash you know, alluded to this. 
Um, we needed to do this, and on the other hand, uh, we understand um, the uh, additional pressures that it causes at our universities. Um, so it's required a lot of all of us, and I want to thank the presidents um, for jumping in and participating um, uh, in all of these decisions. This is a unique challenge. You probably didn't sign up for it um, when, you, <laughs> when you signed on uh, as a university president, but um, everyone, thank you for, for rising to this occasion and, um, and to being our partners. Uh, and Jeff Smith, again, you know, I, I, I mentioned you, um, but I, I really uh, thank you for um, uh, promoting our, our councils of trustees and the best that we can be um, in governance uh, among the councils. Um, and I thank the councils of trustees for stepping up as well. Um, I think I've already talked about uh, ABSCUF. Um, it, you know, it, to me, it, it was about the contract, obviously, but it was more about uh, the relationship. We cannot move forward as a system uh, if we're fighting each other. We just can't. And it, it, was, it was time that that whole thing stopped. Um, and so once again, Ken, thank you. Thank your leadership, and maybe preemptively, thank you uh, to your members. Um, so we've talked about um, this vision that we laid out in January, um, and we've talked a little bit about uh, metrics for what does it mean uh, to be excellent. Um, we drafted and we passed necessary enterprise management policies. Um, we assessed market needs. Um, we asked the presidents to put together um, three-year balanced budgets so we could all really engage in, in what's, what's going on um, and get our arms around what we need to do uh, financially. Um, and we will continue to try to harness the brain power of our 10,000 employees to benefit um, are almost 100,000 students. It's been a huge effort, um, and I need to also thank um, the governor and, and his office for being our partner every step of the way, um, and, and the legislature as well. Um, I, I don't think there's anyone um, that, that Dan hasn't developed a relationship with, um, and you know, you can speak to this, but I, I think the truth is, is once you sit down and t start talking frankly to people and, and talk about the issues and the data and the real things, um, you can get through, uh, you can get through baggage and political stuff. So uh, thank you for doing that and for continuing to do that. So as laudatory as I am, I'm going to stop being laudatory because now we really have to uh, move forward and we've reached the point where um, we uh, are, are going to be talking about actions that are going to be able to put in place this notion of a, of a sharing system. And it is going to require now a cultural change uh, uh, among um, all of us and how we think about our universities, um, which have individual identities and are also part of a system. Um, the point of which is to be, uh, the point of which is to benefit the greatest number of students um, through the ability to work collaboratively. So I, I, I this is, I think I've said this before, um, uh, in a non-personal sense, this is the most important um, and exciting and difficult uh, work I've ever done. Um, if I stopped doing it tomorrow, I would be really sad um, but I would feel proud of how far we've, we've come. And I thank all of you for that. Um, it was important for me to say that and, and to express my gratitude um, and to express my desire to keep going 100 miles an hour. So thank you all very much. Um, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you for your remarks. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is my 411th day. <laughs> he was calculating that when I was talking. Just so we know. Uh, let me just begin by saying that uh, actually getting me to come to Pennsylvania was easy. The real victory was um, getting Melissa to come. And um, as of a couple of days ago, 
Uh, Melissa has uh, packed up our house in Seattle, um, disposed of it, and managed, made, it, made it her way to, uh, to Harrisburg, where we're comfortably living in our empty nest. Um, so thank you, Melissa, and uh, that was a tremendous feat, uh, Chair, uh, in doing that. Um, over the last couple of weeks, uh, in my, as I was entering my 400th, the, the fifth century of my days, I've been able to really re-engage or see the power of public higher education in this commonwealth. I visited, I, I visit all of our universities every term. I visited seven in the last uh, few weeks. Um, and I want to remind us about that power because in the transactional detail and the system change, it's sometimes too easy to forget. Uh, our, our universities are arguably the most reliable pathway into the middle class and beyond. And that is true of public higher education generally. They are engines of economic development. Several of our universities are not only engines of economic development in terms of the graduates they produce, but they are also the number one employer in their, in their regions. And they are increasingly one of the few places left where people can go engage with people who are not like themselves and by engaging with people who are not like themselves can learn tolerance, which is something that is largely lacking uh, in the broader society. And in that tour, I've experienced tremendous opportunities, uh, almost too many to, to enumerate. There was one student the other day who was talking about using the power, of, this is no joke, of predictive analytics in trying to determine what kind of events students will show up in on campus to improve student engagement. Predictive analytics, with some success. Uh, I've had conversations with faculty members who are thinking really creatively about how to do academic programming across our universities in a whole variety of areas. Um, and uh, with uh, a facilities person uh, recently who was uh, having all sorts of really interesting ideas about procurement. So it's really exciting to see the tremendous energy and opportunity. But it's also disturbing to see the threats and sort of Dr. Mash alluded to many of those and they show up in a variety of ways. They're demographic in nature, they're financial obviously, they're political. Um, there are threats that show up in the rapidity of change, the changing demands that our students are making of us and the changing demands that employers are making of us and the changing demands that technologies are forcing us to think about how we do our work. Um, and these, these threats show up particularly in the faces of our students who really experiencing them firsthand as they go through their education and think about their lives. And it occurred to me, and it's not the first time I've had this thought, but it's become increasingly real, that these threats, they're no longer possible to address them at the university level. And that's not taking anything away from our university leadership or our university faculty. The scale of that operation is unable to address the threats which are themselves systemic. <coughs> These threats and these opportunities to be engaged, they must be addressed systemically. They need to be addressed as a matter of urgency. And they need to be addressed courageously because they will force us to set aside everything that we have learned and to relearn again what it means to lead in higher education. They must be addressed by us working together because by working apart, we can only undermine the common cause, and they must be addressed in partnership with the state, which is something we've been talking about and are now beginning to act on. And they will be addressed, or they must be addressed, over the next couple of days, because as the chairwoman has said, a lot of planning and a lot of thinking and a lot of analysis have gone in to development of a pretty detailed implementation route map for building a system that doesn't just survive into the 2020s, but thrives in the 21st century. And those decisions and those issues, while they're relatively straightforward to describe, and they're relatively straightforward to act on, require true acts of courage and innovation by countless hundreds of folks working across this system so that they can be realized in the interest of our students and in the interest of our commonwealth. The work is hard, but we've set ourselves to do it. It's really interesting in the last couple of months, you know we're moving because you can feel the 
the sides of the train beginning to shake as it moves down the track. But that's a good thing. And I get the sense, uh, Chair, that working together, we will not only address the many challenges that we face, but realize the opportunities that are there for us. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the next couple of days. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Dan. So we're now going to move into um, our first committee meeting, which is the University Success uh, Committee. And let me just uh, remind the board uh, that you are all encouraged to participate in discussions um, <coughs> and ask questions, uh, but only committee members of University Success um, are allowed to vote on respective uh, actions that will be under consideration. Um, and then at the end uh, of the committee meetings today and tomorrow, we will come back into full board mode to consider final approval of all of the committee actions um, that we'll be talking about. So um, again, please speak up. Uh, this is interactive. Presidents, uh, as always, uh, you're invited and, and encouraged to participate in discussions as well. Let me now turn the gavel over to Tom Muller to moderate the University Success Committee. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. A uh, little unusual. We would have had the committee meeting earlier, but we decided we wanted to have it today in, in front of everybody else, so you'd have a chance to hear all the issues. Uh, I'll ask Audrey to do a roll call of the University Success Committee, please. Audrey? Governor Nicole Dunlop? Here. Governor Thomas Muller? Here. Representative Brad Roy? Here. Chairwoman Cynthia Shapira? Here. Alternate designee Allison Jones? Here. Governor Neil Weaver? Here. Governor Janet Yeomans? Here. Chair Muller, you have a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Audrey. We have a full agenda for today's committee meeting. All the items for today's discussion are about redesigning the state system from its current state of 14 decentralized universities to one where we collectively focus on systemness to both improve services to our students and to improve sustain our sustain sustainability, while also acknowledging that each of our universities is unique and has a brand that its students, alumni, and communities are very proud of. As you recall, at the July board meeting, Rosa Lara provided a system redesign update that included the status of all the project team activities. This time, the system redesign update will, will occur throughout both days of, the, of this meeting. This committee has several items in front of us that, that came from the work of the investment team, the budget team, and the shared services review that was conducted in part with the technical assistance of Ernst & Young. First, we will be discussing the work of the investment team, which has produced several policy items for our consideration, as reflected in the three action items associated with agenda item 6A. While two items, the investment policy and auxiliary policy, are largely language housekeeping to allow for current activities, we do have a new policy item in front of us, the University Financial Sustainability Policy. This is a proposed policy that was discussed in concept at the July board meeting. The policy and a corresponding set of procedures and standards were crafted as part of the system redesign investment team activities. I'd like to thank Bob Thorne from Cal U and Lori Bernatsky from Westchester for their roles as co-leads of the team as well as the team members and all who assisted in moving this policy forward. Now I'd like to turn it over to Sharon Minnick to walk us through. Sharon? Thank you, Tom. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to be covering uh, various aspects of system redesign over the next two days across all five levels of the implementation plan. If you recall, this is a slide that uh, has been presented over the last uh, couple board meetings. and so. Today, we're really going to focus on um, the first area around strengthening governance and accountability. Uh, this charge came out of the January board meeting. Uh, and our conversation this morning on the first policy, or this afternoon, is really around strategic finance retooling from the January board meeting. And that was developing a system level pool of investment and guidance on actions resulting from over and under performance. So it's coming out of that January charge that the board provided to the, the system. So I take a little bit of time and just kind of 
talk through why this policy is important. As you heard from the chair and the chancellor, there are a lot of factors that are impacting the universities uh, related to declining high school graduation populations, impacting our enrollment. We have affordability issues that we have been discussing, uh, competition from new players in the higher education market, as well as changing expectations of what the graduating population is looking for from higher education. And these can be seen in what has been occurring to the unrestricted net position of, to the system over the last several years. The unrestricted net position is really the reserve of resources, cash receivables available to the universities. Um, as this has declined at increasing rates, what it does is it places the system at risk to be able to make the investments needed to better serve the students today as well as those in the future. And so the policy that we're going to be talking about today is really designed to allow us to collaborate so that we can change this direction. So before I jump into the policy, I also want to take a step back and talk a little bit about how this policy fits into that governance and accountability framework. If you recall, in January, the board, in addition to the um, strategic financing charge, also affirmed metrics, which the chairwoman um, spoke about, in terms of university success and student success. Those metrics over the last nine months have been aligned to a variety of things, including the goal-setting activities that the universities are engaged in right now. They've been part of the performance review um, incorporated into that new process that we're rolling out over the course of the next year. A piece of those, uh, one component of those metrics is aligned to the budgeting process that we'll talk about later today. And then they also fold into the policy, the university financial sustainability policy and procedures that we're talking about, as well as the financial risk assessment. So it's really looking at those metrics both from a strategic perspective on where do we want to go in goal setting, and then the operational or tactical perspective on how do we get there um, to meet those goals moving forward. And we also wanted to make sure that we were consistent. So when we're looking at measures and looking at definitions, we're using the same terms and the same numbers, whether it's in a goal or the budget or the policy document from the indicators that we're talking about. Also within the governance and accountability framework, we used the newly created governance processes to help craft the policy. Um, the policy was developed by the Joint System Redesign Investment Team, and you can see the stakeholders that were engaged in the actual policy creation. Uh, the policy, as well as the administrative procedures and standards, went out through many, many review cycles um, to the chief academic officers, the chief financial officers, the presidents, uh, the councils of trustees, so we wanted to make sure that as we looked at this policy, we were being as inclusive as possible in both the policy design as well as the feedback to incorporate what we wanted, what everyone wanted to get out of the policy as we move it forward. So, and also as we worked through um, the early stages of the policy development, we really heard themes that we had a, a theme setting session. Um, probably we we started the work in May, so it couldn't have been that long past May. Probably June timeframe with the ELG to talk about the themes that they wanted to make sure that the policy included. And and what came out very very clear was that they wanted a policy that would look at early intervention. So if a university is experiencing a struggle. How early can we find out and what can we do collaboratively to problem solve with that university? So early intervention was a key theme from a policy development perspective. Second, it should focus on collaborative policy, uh, problem solving. So with the establishment of the executive leadership group and the system leadership group and those new governance processes, how do we incorporate those entities into collaborative problem solving? Because the problems, as you heard earlier, that we face are not 
university specific and a university probably can't solve them alone. So if we collaborate, we'll have a better problem solving activity um, as we move forward. So that was the second theme that came out. The third was that it should align to the goals around the system investment and guidance for over and under performance. So the, the strategic goal from the board in January around alignment and making sure that we have um, monitoring and performance, monitoring of the actions and uh, updates over the course of time was the third theme that came out as we've started to develop the policy. In the board documents, you can see these themes in the language of the policy that is in front of you. An overarching theme, and I think it came out of probably some of the earlier conversations historically, was that we wanted to make sure that we were consistent in using data. And so we wanted to intentionally uh, use the metrics from the university success um, metrics that were affirmed by the board in January. We wanted to use the data points that were already in the financial risk assessments that the universities receive and make sure that we're consistent across those um, items. And so the team intentionally uh, left the indicators at a high level so you can see the indicators within the policy um, they are more detailed in the Administrative Procedures and Standards document, but they wanted to allow that high level in the policy so that it has flexibility. So as the market changes, as the board affirms additional metrics, we have the ability to incorporate, the, incorporate them quickly into the procedures or make updates based on lessons learned as part of the procedure document. And so the indicators within the policy are intentionally at a high level so that the procedures can go um, into more detail. Um, the board did affirm additional metrics in July that are being incorporated into the document um, and will be as over the course of the next several months. So as measures change or metrics change and you want to see different things, we have that flexibility within the procedure document. Um, and finally, if you think back to the kind of metrics and overall governance process with the where do we want to go and how do we get there from a strategic and operational perspective. It allows the ability through the performance review and goal setting and the actions that universities would take as part of the policy to be built into those leadership conversations uh, with the presidents and with the chancellor. So it allows that review cycle as well. So how would we um, implement the policy. Uh, we are looking at uh, four indicators that are in the draft procedures that each university would be um, reviewed against. Um, those are a collaborative review process with the CAOs and the CFOs as well as the president of that university to determine where a university fits among the sustainability plans. Uh, that would also include feedback from the Council of Trustees as well as the executive leadership group, the ELG, so that we could determine where a, um, where a university fits and what kind of actions based on that uh, determination they should be taking to collaborate and uh, address any challenges that they have in front of them. That results in a financial sustainability plan. Again, that goes through a similar review cycle to make sure that we get different lenses and different feedback into it, uh, going through the system leadership group, the executive leadership group, with the councils of trustees. And then it goes into monitoring um, to make sure that if a plan is going, is put in place to address a challenge that the university is facing, that we can take action and meet milestones. And if they're not meeting a milestone, then what's going on? How do we make those adjustments and help that university based on what they thought was going to happen that may not have happened? Um, so also, I just want to point out that as part of the indicators, we're, while we're focusing in on four areas from a sustainability perspective, from a financial health perspective, all of the indicators in the policy are really to be used by the universities as they develop their plans because different triggers and different 
indicators can give insight to that university in terms of what they would want to do um, and what levers they may have or may not have to make changes. And so it's not just four, it's across the whole, but they're used in different ways. And so with that, I will turn it back to Tom to Thank you, Sharon. You know, my mother always said she had eyes, always thought she had eyes in the back of her head, and I always wish I did so I could see the bigger type up here behind me. <laughs> I hope everybody could, could follow along well there. Development of this policy and associated procedures and standards included the review and input by many groups, including chief academic officers, and administrative and financial vice presidents, presidents, board members, trustees, and union representatives. Before us today is a recommendation for the approval of the draft university financial sustainability policy found on page 12 of your meeting materials. In support of the committee's action on this item, I move that the Board of Governors approve the new policy 2019-01 university financial sustainability. Do I have a second from the second. committee? Jan, thank you. Is there any discussion among the committee? <coughs> I'll take a vote then. All in favor? Uh, uh, uh. Oh, let's up. Oh. No, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't have any questions. I just, uh, uh, you know, this is another thing I thank everybody. Um, th this, is a, uh, this is important. This is a big move, a big step, um, and a big step uh, toward systemness and toward um, our promise around accountability. So thanks to everybody uh, for getting us to this place. Yes, I, I'd echo that. Echo that. The, uh, the fact that there was not a lot of discussion here is not a reflection on, uh, or a suggestion there was a lack of effort. A lot of effort got to get us just to this point, and a lot moving forward. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh, so. I was just going to ask one question before the vote, if that's okay. So on um, page 14, it talks about the difference between two different types of plans that could be involved, inter-university loans or loans within the state system um, to the universities at risk of insolvency. So by inter-university loans, I take it you mean something like um, borrowing from a auxiliary reserves on some type of a formal basis from your own auxiliary reserves. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, there's, yes, there's two kinds of loans. One is auxiliary to ENG and ENG to auxiliary or vice versa, and that's within the purview of the university. And then the second type is one that would be coming to the system from system funds. So those are the two types. Do you have in mind any type of prioritization scheme? Did you anticipate that, that universities are going to borrow within themselves first before they would have the ability to go out and seek loans from other state system schools? Is that, is that sort of... Yes. But I couldn't tell if that was in the market. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's exactly how, how we exhaust our own resources and then we have the opportunity. Right. Right. To, right. And ideally, ideally, you would have an action plan to not exhaust the resources. And right, so right, it's right. trying to get that early invention. Oh, if, if, if you would have to do this, how do you make those changes early on so that you're not doing that? And that's really the intent of okay, that. Thank that's you so the much. intent. But if you get to the point where uh, you, you know, a university is coming to the system, you know, then there are certain things in place, um, you know, that, that give the system uh, the ability to do that um, and, you know, create the, the, this accountability relationship with the university, insist on a plan, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, again, just within the committee, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Sharon, please go ahead and walk us through the next two policy items since they are cleanup language changes, essentially. Sure. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the next item is the investment policy, which is uh, pages 17 through 26 in the board book. <clears throat> this policy is um, from 1986, so it is not a new policy. Uh, it primarily focuses on funds management. However, it does and has historically provided for loans for certain activities. So the first area is simply clean up um, around uh, aligning to the new committee language or the new committees that we have as a board. Um, the second changes are on pages 21, um, and that clarifies the difference between system notes and bridge notes. So system notes speaking to the prior policy are those where a university could come in for a system loan, bridge notes for construction purposes. Um, and then it also provides for the ability of appropriation advances. We have done those in the past. This just allows that practice to be conducted via a policy. Um, so those are the main changes. Again, they're cleanup uh, 
making it a little bit more clear and adding the appropriation advances which we currently do. Chair, and thanks. I'd like the committee to consider these two items together, combining the motions found on pages 16 and 27 of your no. material. Oh, sorry. Let, let me do the auxiliary one really okay. quickly. Sorry. Uh, the auxiliary policies on pages 28 and 29, um, that one focused primarily on auxiliary activities defined as residence halls, food service, student centers, um, and requires that auxiliary revenue and expenditures are managed separately. Again, that's a policy that's been in place for years. What this does is allows that ability to do the loans back and forth between the ENG and the auxiliary funds. It's been occurring. This just kind of makes sure that we have the policy in place to allow the practice to occur. Um, and so those that's really what that one focuses on. So, sorry. Now I can combine them. Now you can. Thank you. I'd like the committee to consider both at the same time. And therefore, I move the Board of Governors approve the revisions to Board of Governors policies 1986-02-A, investment, and 1996-03-A, defining auxiliary expense in enterprises and associated cost allocation. Do I have a second? I'll second, second the motion. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Now we will turn to item 6B to discuss our efforts to build a sharing system. During the July board meeting, we also had a presentation about the sharing system project. There were many avenues to explore and we charged the team with the help of our consultants to help narrow the scope and identify where we should focus our energy. This work is critical to our long-term success as both demographics and the higher education marketplace shift. We need our system to be aligned to the future while also maintaining our core mission around student affordability. This means we need to think differently about the delivery of our core services. It also means we need to think differently about enabling infrastructure so we can become a more efficient system and focus our limited resources on our core mission, our students. To get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon Minnick, Rosa Lara, and Donna Wilson to take us through the recommendations for next steps around building a sharing system. I encourage you to interject and ask questions as they go along. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So I'm going to go back to what we've started to call the layer cake. Um, and uh, this section of today's uh, committee meeting is really going to focus on the building the shared infrastructure. And in terms of shared infrastructure, we're using that term very broadly when we talk about system redesign. Um, so it is our um, platforms from a technology, from a shared services. So it's, it's really core underpinnings to support systemness and to enable that vision that the board uh, affirmed in the January timeframe. So it's in support of that uh, January activity. Um, and just a step back, and Rosa will go through the full implementation um, tomorrow, but we are just, we in this committee are just one piece of system redesign. There are active project teams in academic success, in student success, and so you'll be hearing more about those tomorrow, but today we're really focusing on the work efforts in the university success work stream. And what we've done, um, in addition to just move the arrows slightly over to the right as time progressed, is things that are coming out of the board meeting today and tomorrow, uh, we will take into an implementation plan that will be brought for review in the January timeframe. So as things get uh, affirmed, we'll be able to build an implementation plan with milestones associated against those. So I'd like to open with a video to really show, I think, how we think about system redesign.
I, I'd like to thank our, our communications team for pulling that together. Um, it, it started as a concept with um, a stick drawing, and so they, they took that vision and I think really helped to kind of outline what we're, what we're here and what we're um, talking about today. Um, and just kind of what the video was saying is we all, we have the 14 universities, we're all serving our students and our employees in those universities across a very similar array of functions. And what we're talking about uh, in terms of transforming and the items today um, are really around those areas in core infrastructure that will help to improve service delivery, decrease costs, acknowledge each university's unique position because we know that everyone, as um, Tom mentioned in the opening, each university has a unique brand, a unique culture, and we need to make sure that we acknowledge that while we're looking at what we can share. And from those savings and efficiencies, how do we redirect those dollars to go back to the core mission of the universities, which are its students? So that's the thread um, that we looked at when we're talking about system redesign and the areas that we're going to do a deeper dive in today. And those three areas are administrative functions, um, which are not that exciting to talk about, but we'll talk about administrative functions, supporting technology for students um, to enable students and student services. So those are the three that we're going to walk through. And please, as we go through, feel free to uh, <coughs> ask any questions. So if, if you recall, um, back in July, we actually engaged uh, Ernst & Young in the um, June time frame, end of May, June, to conduct an overall assessment of what the opportunities would be in front of us as we wanted to talk about systemness and system redesign and sharing. And they conducted an analysis, a quick analysis in the June um, time frame and presented that to the board in July. And that analysis was very, very broad and had a lot of different areas that we could explore on it. <clears throat> but they boiled it into four key areas. The shared service consortium, the online pathways, shared IT environments, and facility sharing. And so I'll speak to the shared service consortium and facilities, and then I will turn it over to Donna and um, for the online pathways and Rose for the shared IT environment. From July until uh, the end of August, early September, the team engaged in additional data collection with the universities in the office of the chancellor. They engaged in um, sessions with employees to talk about how they thought about different services and could we do them in a shared environment, what level of buy-in or change management would we need based on that level of buy-in from the individuals who are performing these services today. And they presented that out in the uh, end of, or early September timeframe, end of August. Um, between that time frame and today, uh, we've done a lot more work in refining the areas that we wanted to focus on so that we could address the core, um, the core mission on the prior slide around trying to decrease costs, trying to redirect those dollars into student services, where can, where can we do um, enabling technology to improve service delivery. And we wanted to make sure that as we narrowed the scope, that we were doing it in a way that was um, something that we could build an implementation plan against. And so when we talk about that timeline slide, what's coming out of here will end up into an implementation plan that we're going to need to execute against. So as part of the narrowing of the scope, we wanted guiding principles that we wanted to work around. And so those were around optimizing student success and university success and advancing financial sustainability. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we were doing, we're trying to hit those three um, goals. We wanted to look at technology as an enabler for the universities and for the activities that we're doing and not a driver of a decision. We wanted to roll the, initials, the initiatives that we would be affirming or moving forward with in ways that were gradual and allowed for lessons learned and milestones. So if we were hitting a milestone or not hitting a milestone, we had the built-in checkpoints and communications outbound as it relates to that, as well as once we um, implemented something that we could build lessons learned in before we took the next step. So what, what you will see between um, what was done at the end of September for some of you who were uh, participating on the advisory committee 
to the system redesign teams uh, as well as others is that the scope got narrowed um, to things that we want to make sure that we can successfully achieve and then as those um, implementation plans occur and things are live, then we can take on other activities. <clears throat> so the first area that I'll <clears throat> speak to is the Shared Service Consortium. <clears throat> and this consortium it, between the end of uh, September and now has changed a lot. Uh, there are two things that are kind of the first areas from a scope perspective to reduce risk. One is there were conversations early on in this consortium around uh, financial aid and admissions processing. <coughs> the risk around that without having any wins on the books from a consortium and implementation perspective they, and the impact on students, we wanted to de-scope that and make sure that we can stand the consortium up properly before we bring in things that have a direct touch on students. The second area that was pushed was facilities, and it's not off the table, it's just elongated in the project plan as we look at what we wanted to do. There's only so many things you can do and so many um, activities you can undertake at one time, so we wanted to move facilities. So if you recall some of those early conversations from the July <laughs> board meeting, that has been descoped, and what we're focusing right now on are things that are currently either shared and performed by the Office of Chancellor staff. So we have a shared service organization within the Office of Chancellor that performs services in HR, IT, and procurement. Or they are shared in that universities um, perform those activities for other universities. So the idea is let's start with things that we know we can move into the new model um, and then build the model, build the processes, and then look at other services. We still believe, though, that the idea of a consortium rather than the current model is the direction that we want to go. Uh, the consortium allows us to provide governance uh, related to the universities over the service delivery. It allows us to put in key, uh, key performance indicators, service level agreements, things that we don't have in today. So we think that concept of moving to a consortium is the direction that we uh, would like to move forward with, uh, just with a, um, the, the scope limited to IT, HR, and procurement to start with. <clears throat> so ooh, I do want to take one step back, because I didn't mention this, and you're going to see it on the other slides. You see the introduction of Wave Zero, and Wave Zero is the, mm -hmm. I, the concept of before we're jumping in and providing a service, we need to do the foundational work to get to that service up and operational. And so throughout um, the Shared Service Consortium or the online, we've added this concept of Wave Zero to build in the infrastructure needed to actually implement in a um, manageable way. <clears throat> so what would a consortium look like? Uh, now I'll start with the inner circle where it says consortium governance. Uh, the consortium leadership committee would be comprised of universities. And so they would be governing the services that would be provided by the, cons um, the Shared Service Consortium, the SLAs that would be put in place if there were new services that they wanted. Um, that would be a new leadership committee that would be formed. Within the consortium governance process, there are subject matter experts. We currently have them out in the universities in uh, directors of procurement, HR directors, IT. We would need to make sure that those individuals from a service delivery and receipt of the services are also part of the conversation um, as related to whichever service line we would be looking at. And so the governance changes from one where uh, it is does not have a governing body of the universities to one with a governing body of the universities with subject matter experts within each of the universities as well. Um, on the lighter blue side, you see a consortium director and then the three services that we would look to bring in uh, first, procurement, HR, and IT. Um, and the two new areas that you see on the box is, is service management and transition and communications. Service management is really around making sure that regardless of the thread 
whether it's HR or procurement, that the same level of service, the same kinds of standard operating procedures, reports are provided to the universities <coughs> as customers, and the Office of Chancellor would be a customer. Um, transition and communications is really something that as you roll a service in, you need to make sure that we are communicating with the individuals who are using the service or impacted by the service change. So if they were doing it today and it's 25% of their job and that's going into a consortium, how do, we how do we communicate with that employee? How do we communicate with the individuals who are using the service? So we need to make sure that we have those individuals to, and that lens on the consortium activities. From a uh, direct report, it is really the consortium director to the university governance teams or leadership committee uh, from an indirect, because we have to put it somewhere on the organization chart, it's within the uh, uh, vice chancellor for administration and finance, which is my role. Um, both the board and the chancellor can request or direct services to be provided by the consortium. Uh, the chancellor has the uh, authority within the act for system-wide business pro processes and the board through policy and procedure that they want to see enacted could implement things that we would want the service to be performed from the consortium. Just a little bit on the benefits. Um, we're looking to stand this up in a net neutral way from a cost perspective because we already have some of these services billed. We, wanna, we have been uh, strategically holding positions that have been vacant to make sure that as we transition, we don't have a negative impact on the universities from a cost perspective. Um, another benefit, would, as we discussed, would be better transparency around billing so you know what you're getting for the service and how much you're paying for that service customer service level agreements so that if we say we're going to do something within the consortium and turn it around in 24 hours, we'll be turning it around in 24 hours. And if we don't, that you're having that customer service conversation with the, the provider. And then we'd like to lean things out so that we can drive down costs and those costs can be redeployed back to the universities. Um, to get there, we go into the wave zero activities. We have a lot of... Um, stand-up work to take the individuals who are currently performing activities into a consortium model, standing up standard operating procedures, all of the metrics, the baselines, et cetera, that we talked about. So that would be part of the wave zero activities. There's a core piece of infrastructure that would we need for procure to pay. So if we look at those three components, right now we are very paper-based and decentralized in procurement, very paper-based in uh, accounts payable. And so it's hard to move accounts payable into a shared service model when it's a paper-based Based process. So we need to do some automation first and then do the analysis to determine based on automation and how much paper we can eliminate completely and touch points we can eliminate completely that we can then transition that into um, the a new service delivery model. And so there's an implementation there. We also can do um, strategic sourcing through this during the same wave zero and sourcing will allow some centralized contracts which will have immediate savings to the universities. So that's part of the plan mm -hmm. to get those costs down so that they can start to save. Um, and then on the HR thread, we would look to do um, an activity analysis. We currently have about 40,000 SAP transactions processed within the Office of Chancellor's service delivery. There's 90,000 out in the universities. What can we automate? Based on that automation, how can we um, potentially do a shared services within HR that would streamline operations, but still keep those high touch activities out at the universities? Sharon, question. Mm -hmm. um, going back to your previous slide, that <coughs> structure looks awfully complex. It has a lot of, a lot of different levels and uh, a lot of moving parts. Is that um, the optimum structure, do you think, for, for agility? Because agility is really a high priority for us. We don't have the luxury of time. Yeah, I, I think you're correct. I think where you're going to see the agility is in the lower, where you have the subject matter experts in the um, HR or procurement, and having that direct service conversation. And then the larger group is really the strategic, you know, what services should we bring in next? What, so you kind of have to have both, um, but. So those lower people, will they be empowered to make the day-to-day -day decisions and not have to go back and get signatures and check boxes and things like that? that that's what we have to work through. But that would be the goal, that, that that service is, if it's decided that that's what we want to bring in, then those groups have to work through the analysis to 
conduct yeah. the. Uh, yeah, I think well, it's I think it's essential because you can't you can't have their work interrupted. I mean, even two days or something, you lose the momentum on a project, and you add up two days here, two days there, yep. two days there. Pretty soon, you're months behind. Yeah, I do not disagree. But yeah, that that's all has to be built in that first wave zero. Is how do we make sure that we're nimble enough to bring things in and execute quickly? And I think if I can, I mean, this is something that we're this is part of our cultural journey and our learning. Um, we're, we're built to be um, consensus-driven. <laughs> I, I, I accept like, like the chair offered another word. <laughs> that, that's a luxury that I don't think we can afford at this yeah, point. And I think when, De and that, deadlines and I, work, you know? And I think that's the journey. I, honestly, I think it is, um, you know, how do we work together across our various constituencies to be nimble and responsive? It is not something that we were set up to do, and it's going to require not only that we generate a great deal of trust, but we fundamentally retool ourselves with respect of our standard meeting type practices. It's, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I have every confidence we can learn those skills. Thank you. <laughs> I may be picking your brain. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Donna. Or on a bit. There we go. Good afternoon. I am uh, pleased to be able to bring you an update on Cashi Online Pathways. I think it might be helpful to explain why we called this Pathways when we conceived of this as an approach to. Uh, a sharing system delivery of online programs, we thought of it not as kind of a hodgepodge of unrelated courses, but as providing coherent pathways to credentials, whether they were certificates or any level of degrees. So this is, um, again, a sharing system approach to increase enrollments and at the same time to serve a population of Pennsylvanians that is currently underrepresented in the state system. We need closer. And that is the 25 to 64 year old with some college but still needing either a first or a second or maybe even a third credential. And yes, 64 year olds are still earning credentials in the workplace. So the 17 to 24 year old market, that demographic has historically been our core. It has been declining and it is going to continue to decline. But the online adult market is growing and it will continue to grow as the nature of work changes with technology and continual upskilling, gaining new skills learning um, different skills will become the norm for the workforce. S research suggested that there, um, when we are fully implemented and ramped up, there's a population of around 27,000 Pennsylvanians on an annual basis who would be interested in earning a new credential and who would consider earning that credential from the state system that translates into a full-time equivalent, an FTE of about 17,000. And you can see that they are, their interest would be divided among uh, all the way from certificates through doctoral degrees, but with a special uh, interest in the area of associate's degrees and master's degrees. Because we are looking at a coordinated or sharing approach in order to leverage our capacity and our strengths, we investigated models for organizing multiple universities to share delivery of academic programs. We are not the first uh, consortium or system to attempt this, and so there's a lot of experience out there to learn from. After looking at several models, we focused on two, uh, which you see on the slide, and we, we then measured them against some criteria. Um, first of all, feasibility criteria. Simply, would it be possible to implement this operational model or this way of organizing ourselves within our statutes 
and within our collective bargaining agreements? And secondly, would it be possible to implement this model of delivery within our middle states accreditation since each university is separately accredited? Looking at the column on the left, you'll see at the top the feasibility criteria. And then we thought about the things that were most important for us to accomplish in PASHI Online Pathways and measured these models against their potential capacity to help us make gains in those outcomes. So the four outcomes that we looked at were the ability to leverage local brands. Our universities are, uh, it's not for no reason that they're eponymous with the places where they are. They are known in their region, they are highly respected in their region uh, for their quality and their region feels like they are a known quantity. So we need to be able to leverage that however we organize ourselves. Uh, secondly, scalability. To what degree would this model of organizing <coughs> help us to scale to a place where we can actually capture those potential enrollments? Um, student access and success. Uh, do either of the models give us a better opportunity for students across the state in the various regions to access these programs and complete that credential they were looking for? And finally, financial sustainability. So now let's look at the, the two models that we looked at most closely. Divide and conquer um, simply means divide up the programs and conquer the market. So in this way of organizing, one or two universities takes complete responsibility for offering a particular program. So one university might offer all the online nursing Another might offer all of the um, online MBAs. So it's, it's simply a way of, of organizing to get these programs delivered. The consortium model um, is one that's a little more complicated to implement because it involves subsets of universities working together to figure out um, how to deliver together programs across the state to all, of, uh, to all of the regions. So both of these models meet the feasibility criteria. And then if you look at the, I've just learned that these are called Harvey balls. You can think of them as pizzas. If you look at the pizzas, the degree to which they are filled in with the dark color um, shows their potential for helping us to get gains on those particular outcomes. And uh, I won't take time to, to go line by line, but what we learned is that this consortium model, that is subsets of universities working together as a consortium to deliver academic programming, uh, has the potential to deliver more of the outcomes that we are hoping to achieve and PASHI Online Pathways. For the next steps, I'm going to focus on wave zero, which is comprised of additional analysis and discussion. And I, I do that because in phase two and three, when we were reporting out on our findings and on EY's research, that work posed some options options for uh, operating models, options for what we would deliver at local universities, what could be delivered in a, uh, a shared environment, what might be outsourced. And those options generated a lot of discussion, some concern, certainly many, many insightful questions. And so wave zero is really taking the time to have broad, inclusive, robust discussions and to work with the universities to address some of those outstanding issues. Uh, they include, as I said, um, operating models. Which functions should we share? And which ones should we insource? And should we outsource any? The costs and benefits of working with an online program manager. An online program manager 
is a vendor that provides uh, bundles of services. So they might do your marketing, they might do some enrollment management function, they might help with uh, course development. Uh, the governance structure for this shared function and finally uh, the academic planning process which is going to have um, implications for moving forward. Once those are done, we'll be ready to um, enter into detailed design, but all of that really depends on the outcome of those robust discussions. So now I'll turn it over to Rosa. Let's try this. I will, I will lean in. Okay. Afternoon, everyone. I'm going to cover two slides that will talk about the information technology landscape. This first slide highlights the results of data gathering and analysis that occurred over the past few months. On the left-hand side, you'll see the major observations or opportunity areas. In the middle of the slide, you'll see a proposed operating model for IT in the state system. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see some uh, initiatives to begin with. So as far as where we are today, first, we have a decentralized operating model for IT. And what that means is that each institution is, is delivering IT services and products um, individually as well as at the state system. The second is that we don't have a formal documented governance process to drive system-wide IT strategic planning or IT policy setting, and as a result, each institution is essentially doing that on their own. Third, there is not a systemic, systematic process for managing and maintaining all of the products and services that are being delivered across the state system. So what that means is that no single person has a comprehensive view of everything that's going on in the landscape. We don't know what the duplication is. We don't know what the opportunities are. We don't know what the risks are. So there's lots of room for improvement. Next is that we have varying IT capabilities. So what that means is we have, and that's driven from varying budgets, uh, varying staffing levels, varying priorities. Um, so what that makes us think about is there's you know, with the staff that we do have, really thinking critically about what services should be delivered and where should they be delivered. What is the most optimal way to provide IT services to our customers? Last, there isn't a consistent set of IT performance metrics to measure the services that are being provided to customers. So in the middle, you'll see a proposed operating model that, that contemplates IT service delivery using a three-tiered approach. First, there will be a system-wide component for IT that's focusing on strategy, policy, and governance that's inclusive of leaders from all 14 institutions. So we're working together to define the IT strategy. Second, there's, there will be IT services delivered through the consortium that, talk, that Sharon talked about earlier. So those are the, the, the kinds of services that really should be delivered in a shared manner. And then third, there will be IT services delivered at the institutions. There will always be a need for on-ground IT professionals to provide that high-touch uh, customer-facing support. So where do we start? There's a lot of opportunity here. So on the, on the far right, you'll see some foundational items. Uh, the first is implementing that tiered IT governance framework I talked about, and that contemplates documenting uh, a charter for what this body should do, what decision rights should it have, how should it interact with other leadership structures. Um, the second is enabling system-wide cybersecurity. This is something that came across loud and clear from talking to the IT professionals. Each institution is addressing their cyber needs individually, and we feel that there could be more value um, by working together to help address cyber concerns. The third is standardizing an IT chart of accounts. So today it's very difficult to say how much we're spending on technology by vendor or by commodity. If we do this, if we establish a common account code structure to track our expenditures, we'll be able to measure whether the governance process is working. And then last is the common student information system that I'll talk about on the next slide. <coughs> 
So on the next slide, I'll, I'll take a moment and just explain what a student information system does. Um, so it is an IT system that serves as the central hub for all student interactions with their campus. It tracks registration, course catalogs, grades, transcripts, student tests and assessments, building schedules, attendance, financial aid, everything you can think of as far as how students interact is occurring in that platform. Today, we have 14 institutions with 14 student information systems. And so as you can imagine, um, there's varying functional modules across those platforms driven by um, budget and priority. There's varying business processes that students experience. And there's, uh, if you think about the, the staff that's supporting those platforms, Everything they're doing is being done 14 times. So we're maintaining common data 14 times. We're testing uh, 14 times. We're doing upgrades 14 times. So there's certainly opportunity to improve the environment. So the recommendation here is to move to a single common student information system that can simultaneously enable systemness or commonality, areas where we feel we should really be the same, while also supporting institutional autonomy, because we know institutions do need to have some uniqueness in their operations. So some of the benefits of this recommendation, if we think about it just from a student perspective, it will enable um, common functionality um, for students, regardless of where they choose to go. Today, they have a different experience, depending on uh, the investments that an institution has made in their platform. Second, it will enable cross-registration and academic collaboration on a single platform versus today. It can certainly be done, but it would be more complicated with all of the interfaces that would need to be established. It would enable a common student person record so we can track our students as they tra uh, traverse the state system. And, and uh, lastly, it will enable us to leverage our operating scale to realize savings and the additional services uh, from the uh, platform. So those are the recommendations for technology. I'm going to turn it back to Sharon. Can I ask a question? Or, or are we allowed to ask questions? Is, uh, yes. Chair. I'm sorry. Are we allowed to ask questions? Yes, you are. Um, uh, I, I, just because of, you know, the way my mind works and what I've been thinking about the last three years, um, uh, I, I mean, all of these are really exciting. I'm probably most excited about uh, a, a common student information system. What What is the quickest way to get to that path, and what are the major barriers? I mean, how can we get this done fast? So um, right now, uh, the institutions are contemplating a, a potential approach that would enable us to move as quickly as possible. Um, using a cohort-based approach. So we would group institutions into one of three cohorts and um, enable us with the first cohort, I believe, is targeted to go live in March of 21. So that would be probably the most expeditious way to get there. Okay, so even most expeditiously, we, we still can't go live until, I, I guess that was on the timeline I'm remembering, but, but that's the plan. And that would be for the first cohort. Okay. And what are what are the the barriers to getting there right now? Is, so is right now a... we're awaiting institutional decisions to proceed um, with that approach. For sure. Okay. What about financially? Financially, um, the state system will be providing some funding to offset the implementation costs. I think they're they're. As part of our legislative ask, we are going to be requesting additional dollars because we, today we don't have the dollars we need to um, complete the implementation. Tom, it's up to Tom. Observation I have. Sam wants to ask a question when you're. Before we get the other question, the observation I, I had, Rosa, and maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong, is that uh, Sharon talked about IT being an enabler, not a driver. It seems to me right now. It's a blockade or, or a roadblock for us trying to get a, to system this. Is that, is that the case? I would agree. And, and so the, what we're contemplating here is, um, without going into a lot of detail, is proposing a shift to a common platform 
that will enable us to get to greater and greater standardization over time. So as we jump in, uh, technology will be removed as an enabler. We can implement with a limited amount of systemness, and then on our schedule, we can continue on that journey. Thanks. Sam, you had a... Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it seems to me that, that uh, the 14 schools have their own kind of customized plan of, of dealing with student information systems, and that within, even within those, the people in enrollment management are looking at certain things, the people in the alumni relation world kind of, you know, they're looking at certain things, and that they probably have the ability to go into their system and kind of customize it to their specific data needs. How does this type of system allow for individual schools and departments within the individual schools to customize the data that they really need to see that might be different from anybody else? Correct. So, so what we're contemplating would enable precisely that. Yeah, it requires the 14 institutions to agree to that, you know, what, what minimum level of commonality and common data elements, for example, a common student person record, minimally. There might be other things, uh, but beyond that, each institution can have its customized data set, its, its customized screens, things of that nature. So you're saying it's built on a common data set, and then I can go in and tweak that or add in data for that student or, so or there's two components. find other data that I want that maybe nobody else is really looking at? So there's two components. The, uh, you can imagine an area that is shared and the elements, the data elements in that shared environment, there needs to be consensus on and a governance process to make changes to the data that's shared. And then there's a second area that's unique. And so when you think about a data element, you'd have to ask yourself, does it belong in the shared area? Are all 14 of us going to agree to do it this way? Or how is the data this way? Or does it belong in the unique part of the system? Thank you. Cindy, has it? OK, and then I'll give it to, to you. Um, so uh, this yeah. isn't really a question, but just building on that and, and on what uh, Governor Smith has said, um, I would just uh, say to the presidents if this is um, right now at an institutional level um, for, you know, agreement to move forward on this, um, I hope you do. I really urge you to. I think it's critically important. There's not really a viable alternative given our situation. Pardon me, Mar Marcia? I was going to say there's not really a viable alternative okay. given our situation. And you know, my experience with these systems is, whereas the core is, is common to everybody, um, you have a lot of flexibility in, in terms of designing your own reports. And all the information is there. How you access it, slice it, and dice it is up to you. But believe me, you can get whatever information you need to operate your university. Cool. Chair Mueller. Sorry. Go ahead. So. Just to clarify, which platforms would we all be sharing? So would this be like where we do our classwork and like um, where? So where you do your classwork, is that the D2L yes, environment? So that's not what we're talking about here. It's more of the back office um, component. Okay. Neil. Yeah, uh, Sharon, could you talk a little bit about what input you've had from uh, the presidents or students, uh, stakeholders, partners uh, in getting to this point? Uh, it depends on which thread you're talking about. <laughs> um, within the online, and, and I can let Donna speak to that, on the, uh, and Rosa had very different conversations with the CETOs and uh, the team on the IT side. On the shared services, um, it was we had input from universities in both data collection within HR um, mm. procurement, those areas, as well as uh, the stakeholder um, they call them think tank sessions uh, that ENY did as part of the contract process. Um, that input, I think, was more useful in terms of change management and what may or may not work given the university's uniqueness as we look at shared services than uh, data analysis in terms of 
the actual services to be delivered. And that's why what you saw from the broad brush at the end of August, early September got narrowed because we need to make sure that as we look at the kind of shared service consortium that we're taking first the things that we're doing, make sure that we have the processes and procedures built properly before we then go back out for other services to the universities. So I, I don't think that was as broad as it probably should be to get us where we want, and that's why we narrowed the focus. May, Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, and just to help give some context, I'm, I'm trying to sort of follow the presentation, and I was going to wait till you were complete to sort of put them together, but to really get in the weeds, because I just want to understand if I were a consultant coming in from a student information system, whatever platform it may be, and I asked questions, the concerns over nuances is, you mentioned, Rosa, between what's shared and what's unique to the institution, so I imagine there's privacy concerns there, or is it the amount of effort that it would take to input information into the new system, which meant you're now getting into how you classify and code courses at each individual institution, not a question of whether we will share the parent financial information we downloaded from the Department of Education, but I'm trying to get a sense of how you cannot build something that's a skeleton for everything and then allow the user levels to allow for customization as you move down. That way, in phase one, I could only import what fields I have populated versus the expectation to populate. Is that where we're? So, so when I talk about what's shared, it's not so much what, who can see what. It's more about where do we want to be the same. So, um, and that's a measure of the degree to which um, we can change and standardize business processes as quickly as we would need to, to meet milestones, et cetera. So what's being contemplated now is to make it more of a technology implementation initially with minimal um, uh, standardization components just to remove that hurdle and then quickly turn to, okay, what are we gonna tackle next? So that, that's what's being contemplated. I don't know if that answers your question. A bit, a bit. So it's a different way of thinking about an implementation. Mike? I, I, I wanted to say just a couple, three things, and now seems like as good a time as any. First, maybe not visible, because these three folks are very smooth and, and orderly in their presentation, is how much work has happened from the initial concept to now. That's the three of them and the many people from the universities that, that have worked on this together, things have changed a lot because people have thought hard about all of this and there's been an, a willingness to adapt and change appropriately. I would say that's a fundamental component of system redesign because I'm not sure that would have happened five years ago and I just compliment all of them on this work. Second, I want to speak specifically to the student information system and make just a couple comments. This shouldn't be a shared IT title on this slide. This, this tool touches every aspect of our operations at each of the 14 universities. So it's very, very, very complex. We have hundreds or thousands of people trained in using the current systems that we each have. And so this translation and migration is a very, very serious effort. When IUP updated just the current version of our current tool to the latest version, it took us a year of planning and a year of implementation in parallel with running the old system to make sure we didn't fail because we had to touch all of those places. And so when we talk about a timeline here, it's, it's an aggressive timeline for something of this complexity within the environments we sit. So you know, multiply my experience by 14 of us all trying to do this, or even phase one was seven or nine. And so that's very, very important to note. And, 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 and I think that it's reasonable to have that expectation, put out what we have, but, but be prepared. There may be delays because we may discover things that, that pop up that are, are difficult to resolve, even as we're shooting toward all of these benefits to the students. It's very, very complicated. And, and it's going to require a lot of hard work. And again, there may be things that, that we don't know about that will come up along the way. I just, that's a caution, not about doing this, but just about its complexity. And, and I appreciate that. I'll just very briefly, you're absolutely right. Um, as a, an old consultant um, who worked on this kind of stuff, you know, um, and as just an old 
consultant. Um, yeah, you're, you're totally right. You're absolutely right. But the point is, uh, I just think for us, the point is, you know, we got to start somewhere. And just, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with what you said, Mike. I've been a chairman of a hospital board for quite a few years. We've gone through two ownership changes, and each one came with a new records system, which was very painful, particularly for the physicians who had to deal with it all every day. So understand it uh, it takes a lot of planning and time and and but most important it takes a commitment to get there absolutely bill yeah I, i'd like to just add two points um the first one is, is is actually doesn't apply to slippery rock so much because we're on banner already which is the likely system we're going to but if we do not secure additional state funding those institutions that are not on banner will will have a significant cost that they haven't budgeted for in, in any way, shape, or form. So I, I do, you know, I'll speak for my, my colleague presidents because it isn't my problem, but I'm sympathetic to those for whom that is a real problem. Uh, that's number one. And, and two is, is just to speak to the timing issue as well. Um, in another board action, you, you gave us the wonderful freedom to begin to build our own financial aid and pricing strategies. Those are very data dependent. There is a chance, in a, as you're shifting data from one system to another or upgrading, that those data will not be available to you in that period of time because of a mis mistake that occurs. Uh, and Slippery Rock is concerned not about uh, joining, but about exactly when, because we can't have, risk our data going down while we're packaging for financial aid. So, so those are those are some of the the expeditious, you know, the timing issues that we need to think about carefully. So, if there's a hesitancy. It's not we don't want to do this, but we need to carefully lay out how it's done so that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot. Thank you, Sharon. Oh, we got Ms. Bob back there. Yes, thank you. Uh, just wanted to make a comment on the online pathways. Um, First of all, um, I'm very encouraged by the approach uh, that we're taking from what I've heard so far that's been presented uh, both here and um, along the way. I'd like to urge that we also look at non-credit programs too, non-credit bearing programs. Uh, we have not really talked about that. As we talk about the post-secondary market, and um, certainly there's a degree attainment gap there for uh, non-traditional students, 25 to 64, but I'm thinking about that um, person who's maybe been in marketing for a long time and really doesn't understand social media marketing and a non-credit bearing certificate in social media uh, marketing. Um, I think there is a market for programs like that. Um, I like the idea of stackable credentials. You get a certificate online for credit and, and, and maybe apply that to an associate degree and so on. I think that's important. But I would not like to see us seed the non-credit market uh, any longer as well. So I just want to make that point. Sharon, Donna, Rosa, thanks very much for, for all your hard work and efforts on this. And, um, wait, based wait, on, wait. Um, you still want to go? <laughs> we still have some items to cover because we jumped into okay. questions, so I just want to make sure that we cover them all. Um, facilities, and this will be very brief. It, yeah. Oh, facilities, and this will be very brief. Um, this was one that we scoped out and pushed um, to the future state. You can see right now we um, have facilities that's uh, custodial, grounds, maintenance. We have all three models. We have self-perform, outtask, outsource. We need to do a, a deeper dive and figure out, based on the universities, their environment, their markets, what they're interested in, where we may have opportunities to do a sourcing event or not, based on that analysis. But that got pushed out. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dan to speak about the Student Success Center. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Sharon. One of the things we've been uh, uh, thinking about um, uh, in, 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 in the third layer of the layer cake, uh, really about piloting and scaling innovations that help us retain uh, students that we have and enroll new students, uh, the question there is not so much what to do, but how do you actually uh, encourage rapid adoption of things that are proven to, act, to work. Um, so how do you scale initiatives that are uh, proving to be effective? So what we did here was we looked at um, some national models, which are being used by uh, national associations, the American Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, the American Association of um, State Colleges and Universities, uh, the American Association of uh, Community Colleges, 
Um, but it's also being used in states, Texas, California uh, being uh, two of the most um, uh, notable, but there's probably now uh, maybe a dozen and a half uh, statewide student success centers. Uh, they're basically uh, lightweight centers that uh, house really small number of people who are expert in a variety of uh, areas. And they, um, they, they work in different ways, but typically they end up using a cohort-based uh, institute model where cohorts from participating universities kind of uh, meet for two or three days, uh, maybe once or twice a year, uh, learning new techniques um, or, or honing, their, um, uh, honing their practice with uh, existing uh, techniques in areas which, again, have an evidence base under them. Uh, there's uh, coaching support when the cohorts go back to their campus and begin to implement. Um, it's a model which is demonstrating some success, and uh, as I said, in Texas and California has been used at the national level for a while. Uh, the idea is to focus it in the three areas where we're feeling the greatest um, sense of urgency. Uh, one is strategic finance, or sort of four areas. One is strategic finance and enrollment management. This is obviously a big deal. Um, uh, as Bill was alluding to, it's not just about data, it's about expertise in utilizing the data. Um, and that expertise is not uh, always uniformly or widely available, and so how do we actually train ourselves up in those techniques which have a greater degree of uh, potential for impact? Student retention, there's a whole variety of areas that our system redesign teams are looking at. They range from developmental education through uh, pro uh, 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 collaborative academic programming. Uh, we've just launched a bunch of working groups looking at holistic advising, looking at financial aid and affordability issues. Um, and the idea for these teams is to look at, look at exemplary practices across our universities, of which there are many, but also look nationally at practices that are working. And then when we identify things that have real potential, again, how do you train people up the Student Success Center? And then the workforce aligned um, you know, programming really to the point that um, President Pinatello just uh, made a moment ago is you know, how can we move more expeditiously in the non-degree credit uh, bearing market, the non-degree credentialing market. Um, high impact practices is something that comes up a lot when you're talking uh, to academic faculty. Uh, uh, high, the, the impacts of fac uh, high impact practices are known uh, widely. There's a good evidence base under them, uh, but we don't often have the opportunity to step back and expose our um, faculty, and uh, in this case our faculty, and in other cases our staff, uh, to experiencing and learning these uh, practices so they can be utilized more effectively in the classroom. So this is really kind of a scaling I, in my old life, I would call this a scaling play or a scaling approach. Um, uh, it's not about coming up with innovation so much. It's about uh, figuring out how to, 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 to invest in our staff and our faculty so that we can learn the new tricks of the trade, as it were, that enable us to um, improve our performance, improve uh, the experience for our students. So that is uh, Student Success Centers in a nutshell. Oh. Um, and again, just as we look at all of these, we were really focused on how do we improve efficiencies, how do we redeploy savings, uh, so supporting technology, whether it's online or the student information system that we talked about to drive that student outcome. Um, so that was really what we were looking at when we talked about trying to narrow the scope to design for the future. Um, one of the questions that you often hear, and I'm going to put a lot of caveats on this slide, um, <laughs> so please don't. Um, <laughs> come back a year from now and ask us to report on these exact numbers, but at what is the return on investment for the initiatives that we're talking about? And so um, we used uh, both you know, third party as well as uh, our staff to try to determine the a return on investment for all of the initiatives. Uh, this is really the savings that you're looking about on the 12 to 18 and cumulative are when initiatives are fully implemented that we would be able to generate those savings and the implementation uh, obviously takes different times and different schedules and so when you talk about a large-scale project implementation like a student information system it's over a much longer period when you talk about things like strategic sourcing it's over a much shorter period so it has varying degrees of implementation schedules built in um, and if, you know, depending on when we start, the time frame gets elongated, but this is really looking at it from a five-year perspective um, and tenure for the student information system around the consortium and the um, IT initiatives. What we would want to do is make sure that as if we move forward with these, that we are actually tracking our savings and can report back on um, what that uh, return would look like. 
So lots of caveats on this slide, but we wanted to make sure that whatever we were looking at was going to either generate savings and what you do see is online revenue. That is not part of the um, dollars that you see on the slide there. That's in process. That would be an additional uh, amount that if we move forward with, we would want to track and report on as well. And with that, I will turn it back to Tom. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I should have waited for my slide. <laughs> Before I ask Madam Chair if we could take a 10-minute recess, I move that, as found on page 30, the committee recommend that the Board of Governors affirm its commitment to build a sharing system, approve the formation of a shared services consortium, and endorse continued efforts to advance the four areas listed above. May I have a second? Second. Jan, thank you. Is there any further discussion among the committee? Yeah, the only thing further is, and I probably should know that because I'm sure it was in the materials, but again, um, this will go with uh, an affirmation here, this will go then back to the system office to sort of delineate the actual action steps and timeline for all of this, including the, um, the SIS, and then you'll report back on, okay, yeah, fine. That's Thank the plan. You. Okay, well, I'll take a vote then. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I'd suggest if we take a 10-minute recess. Absolutely. You're, you've got the gavel now. Oh, I gave it back to you for a moment. I wasn't sure. All right, and then we'll reconvene in 10 minutes uh, for uh, the remainder of, of this agenda. Thank you. Well, at least the committee could take a 10-minute recess. Yeah, everyone else has to stay <laughs> PCN brings the distinct aspects of Pennsylvania and its residents to your favorite screen. Hear from state government and community leaders during unedited balanced coverage of politics and policy. Dig into the rich history and culture of the state presented by notable residents and historians. Score a view of the best high school, college and world-class athletes competing across the state and much, much more. Start exploring the Keystone State today on PCN and the PCN app. Dark. Now moving on, on to the 2020-21 appropriations request, which you will find on item 6C, starting on page 31 of the board book. Today's discussion is influenced by the work of the system redesign budget team. In July, we received an update about areas that were going to be modified for this year's budgeted process, which were then rolled out in August. I would like to thank Ken Long from East Stroudsburg and Gil Brown from Millersville for their work as co-leads of this team as well as all of the other team members. As we discussed in July, the biggest change we will see in the budget process this year is the introduction of two years of projections, fiscal year 2021, which is our appropriation request year, and the planning year of 2021-2022. This, this is to set the stage for the new multi-year tuition setting process that will begin in the spring. As we move through this transition year and the new budget process, this committee will have an opportunity to work through the new process and identify areas for continued improvement. In addition to the system's recurring E and G appropriation request, that supports the ongoing operations of our universities. The board will consider requesting funds to support the system redesign act activities we, we just discussed. So now I'd like to turn it over to Sharon to walk us through the budget and appropriations request discussion. <coughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, as mentioned, today we're going to look at the system appropriation request, and that contains two major components. The E&G appropriation request that's integral for our universities and their operating budgets, as well as a separate line item request. So this is a bit different than in prior years where we did a request that had one dollar amount um, that was a large amount but not differentiated. So we're really going to talk about those two things separately today. Um, but before I do that, uh, I want to just jump into a little bit about what's changed. Um, we have a new multi-year budgeting process that pushes it for, out for two years to align to that tuition policy that will um, be uh, coming forward in April if universities are interested in proposing their tuition plans. Um, so we wanted to get sure, ensure that that was started. Um, and I want to just start with that this is a transition year, so it is a little bumpy as we put in place kind of parts of what we could get done for the new model with the full uh, activities to be rolled out next year. So uh, please just note that we're in this transition year. Um, 
the assumptions for 2021, we really did give some assumptions around the appropriation request, which we'll talk about in a little bit around that cost to carry, um, looking for uh, realistic enrollment projections. Um, and then we, uh, as part of system redesign, focused a lot on definitions and making sure that we had uh, accurate definitions for various categories as part of the budgeting process. Um, Expenditures that you're going to look at are really mandatory cost increases that we know at this point in time. Um, so you will see those included. And again, this is a transition year. Uh, we have working. We are working to align the budget process with the goal setting template of the universities. We also found in this transition year that the template that we currently have probably needs to be reworked as we move to the new model. So it doesn't quite fit what we would like it to do moving forward. But we just didn't have enough time between May when we kicked this work off and August when we had to send the instructions out to get the template in place, um, and then alignment to the multi-year uh, tuition process. So I want to start by focusing just on the budget requirements for 1920. As you look at the pie that we have from a total system perspective, we have a $2.3 billion budget. Um, we have most of that 1.7 in ENG, educational and general fund, or general and those dollars are aligned to academic administration, uh, physical operations, including uh, tuition revenue and appropriations for and student fees. And so that's the largest component of the budget that we're talking about. There are two other components, auxiliary, we talked about the policy earlier today, and those are the self-sustaining operations uh, for student rec centers, dining, housing, et cetera, and then restricted, which are dollars from external sources that have restrictions placed upon them. Um, they could be research grants, and that's a very small component. But what the board has authority over is the E and G from both an appropriation perspective as well as tuition uh, perspective. So that's what we're going to focus the rest of the conversation on. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so just some key items. The board historically approves the 1920 budget as the basis for the 2021 request. Um, key uh, things just to note that as you know, you've seen in the headlines, uh, universities are still experiencing continued enrollment declines. Um, these declines coupled with the tuition freeze for the year that was done so that we maintain student affordability have impacted universities' abilities to manage um, through this year. And so you see that in different in how the different uh, approaches were to budgeting um, to make sure that the universities um, are planning appropriately based on those enrollment declines and tuition freeze. Uh, you see planned use of carry forward being utilized, and this does uh, this is used for two things. It's both used by universities to implement strategic initiatives that are one-time activities as well as balancing the budget. Um, again, we are projecting the compensation expenditures only to the known contracts that we have. Um, and then just as you all know, um, each university outlook really varies based on the university, the region it, it um, serves, the complement, the program mix, the space utilization. So every university has a different um, look and feel, but those university budgets are all what's rolled up for the system budget. Um, the big driver for the budget is our annualized FTEs and our enrollment because that drives tuition and fees. And so we look at annualized FTE as a driver for revenue. Um, and the reason we look at annualized FTE versus a head count is because it provides a better projection of revenue. If a student's taking a part-time load, uh, they're paying per credit rather than a full-time rate. If they are taking more than 18, they're paying that surcharge. It also includes winter and summer, and so it's a better projection of the revenue dollars. And so from a budgetary perspective, we're using an annualized FTE. Um, you can see also from a revenue perspective that breakdown of in-state, out-of-state, gra graduate in-state and graduate out-of-state, that <coughs> mix also drives revenue. And so <coughs> universities closely monitor both the mix of the <coughs> students as well as um, mm -hmm. the 
tuition policies and strategies that they have around those student mixes. So when you roll our uh, budget up oh, for 1920, um, what you are looking at really is um, and our appropriation for this year as it was passed in the July timeframe and appropriated out, the projected tuition and fee revenue associated with the projected enrollments uh, that the universities have, uh, as well as then the expenditure side around salary and benefits with those known cost increases, um, as well as the uh, capital and expenditures. And this is really debt service transfers to uh, plant for deferred maintenance on their ENG properties. So that's the overall picture. Um, the enrollment is pretty close to what we were projecting when we met in the July timeframe. Um, and so I want to just pause for a moment, I believe, and have any questions on the 1920 before we transition into the actual appropriation F. Um, and I am moving quickly because we do have a time limit. <laughs> so um, just as an appropriation request, uh, again, we're doing two years, so we will be looking for the board to approve 2021. Uh, the planning estimate is just that. It's a planning estimate. Um, next year, we'll be doing the same thing with a one-year approval with a planning estimate as a uh, item just for awareness and information purposes. Uh, so I'm going to go through the assumptions relatively quickly. Um, again, as we look at the future uh, years, 2021 specifically, uh, enrollment is projected to continue to decline, although the decline is not as great as we have uh, seen. Um, we had an appropriation assumption that we asked the universities to budget for for the 2021 year. And that assumption is around a 2% or cost to carry budget, which is a little bit different than in the past. Um, these were also the governor's budget instructions out to the system to do a cost to carry budget. When we looked at that cost to carry over time, uh, we had 2% last year, 2% the prior year. So it, it seemed a more realistic assumption around a request for a cost to carry appropriation request, knowing that we were also going to ask for a specific line item request. Um, net price strategies for the year, um, for next year, will be coming to the board in the spring timeframe. So right now, we're, um, we are working with the universities, and they're working to determine which ones uh, which of the universities want to actually present a pricing strategy in April. So we don't have that uh, detail yet, but we know that some are doing that due diligence and maybe bringing a pricing strategy in the April timeframe. Um, universities are going to continue as we look at the budget and we look at the enrollment and revenue projections, continue to make those adjustments to their structures so that they can be financially stable. Um, so you will see that over the course of time, and that will ebb and flow based on the activities on a university campus and what they can do in terms of making those adjustments to drive down their cost structures to meet their revenue. It's going to shoot up. So again, going to the annualized FTEs that we received from the universities, we see the projections. Um, a slight decrease from 1920 uh, across the system as a whole. Uh, we Just to, to note as part of redesign, we are also uh, looking to create a sub-team to work on a projection template. Uh, that activity is early, early stages, so it's not visible in these numbers, but that's another ongoing activity as we look at projections, uh, but we were trying to get realistic projections for enrollment as, um, for our annualized FTE enrollment as part of the budget uh, conversations. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sitting close enough. Um, and then you do see that that stabilizes very, very slightly in the 21-22 year. Again, you know, 
you will not be acting on that year, but this is just informational. And as we go through this year and into the spring and look at where we're projecting it, we'll, we'll be doing those updates to those years as well. When you roll it up, again, looking at that high level uh, roll up of our um, in-state, out-of-state, uh, we are again seeing uh, in the in-state undergraduate declines more than the other areas, uh, just from a number of change from a percent. Um, again, this is talking about the demographics that we talked about in the high school graduating population, um, having that impact on the in-state undergraduate enrollment numbers. Major cost drivers for our budget, as you are well aware, um, Running a university is a people business. Uh, we have faculty, we have staff to support student wellness, we have facilities, and so salaries and wages are the largest driver of our um, costs in terms of our operating budget. Uh, we also have pensions um, and healthcare increases, and those are about 4% that we're projecting, and those are based on information both provided by the Commonwealth to the system as well as our healthcare providers, and so that's factored into the cost drivers. Um, and then you see another area where you see a significant increase, and that's student financial aid. And that addresses the conversations that the university is affecting affordability. And so trying to put more money into student financial aid allows them to become a more affordable option and helps students. And so you see we've got the personnel costs salary, wages, benefits, and then the, the next main driver is our financial aid. So that then rolls us to the actual projection. Um, what you're seeing here is if you see the state appropriate appropriation, which is the item that you guys are going to be focused on today, the appropriation that we received in 1920 was a $477.5 million appropriation. We are doing an ask of 487, which is a 2% increase, um, <coughs> same that we got the prior year. And then how the universities have based on um, tuition uh, assumptions and the appropriation assumptions made the appropriate adjustments to uh, manage their <coughs> expenditures so that you know we can be sustainable and um, serve the students in the communities here in Pennsylvania. And with that, and I am sorry I'm going very quickly through it, but I'm going to turn it back over to Tom. Thank you, Sharon. I hope uh, Ken's going to give you a drink later tonight <laughs> for all the work we're, we're having to do this afternoon. I move that the committee recommend that the Board of Governors approve the fiscal year 2019-20 E&G budgets for the state system universities and office of the chancellor reflected in attachment one as the basis for the system's appropriation request and an a fiscal year 2020-2021 E&G appropriation request of 487 million, 19,000, 19, an increase of 9.5 million or 2.0 percent, reflected in attachment two. We have a second. Second. Any discussion on the committee? I just, I just have one question, and that is, um, do we have contingency plans in case some of our assumptions prove too optimistic in these numbers? We. We actually, um, I wouldn't say we have optimistic assumptions and uh, outside of, are you speaking specifically to enrollment? Because yeah. the expenditure assumptions were probably, or the appropriation and the health care were relatively um, not optimistic in terms of the dollars that we would be getting in. They were pretty realistic. Yep. Um, I think, you know, each university, and I don't want to speak for them, but each university I know manages and monitors enrollment on probably a daily, <laughs> weekly, monthly basis because it has such an impact on their operations and they are making adjustments as they see those numbers change. Um, I don't know if you... 
if you guys would want to comment on oh, it, so the bottom line notion. Assumptions. We don't have to get into a lot of details, but you have you have a high level of confidence in these numbers. I think the enrollment uh, the enrollment projections are probably a, more realistic than we've seen in the past, based on as well as the personnel, based on the definitions that we've provided outbound and trying to get to more realistic budgeting. Um, so it's a it's a transition. It's a, a process. So we will look again. You know, we're going to talk more about enrollment um, with the redesign team. But that's probably the one that um, we will watch very closely over the next several months. Thank you. And, and Jan, I would say that um, to a certain extent, the sustainability uh, policies and framework we we just passed. That's the contingency. You know, you know, in a way. Okay, I'd like to call the vote. All in favor? Aye. Can I ask a question? Any opposed? Wait, wait. Oops. I'm not on the committee. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, thank you. Inherent in, you know, in, in a lot of this is um, maintaining a current level of affordability with tuition. <laughs> is the set point that we had for 2019, is that, that what we're looking at there, or is that kind of placeholder language? I think that's going to be a question that, as we talk with appropriation committees and legislators, that's going to come up. And I think we need to know what that specifically means, if possible. We can't know exactly. I understand that. But I think there should be some, you know, what, what are our aspirations in terms of tuition going forward? I'm going to defer to Dan on this one. <laughs> you can punch a share. That's where you get the big bucks. <laughs> Sorry, so Dan. I think you know I, I think this is a conversation that the board is is going to need to have, um, uh, and and um, and what is what does that mean in terms of the um, uh, uh, we, you know we have account we have affordability measures we have a bunch of them um, except expected family contribution uh, net average price I probably missed one or two. Uh, and I think the question that the board's going to have to address itself to is you know if you look at those numbers, what are you comfortable with? Are we looking at something which is, because um, you have to do it in terms of averages because of price discounting, and use of institutional aid, et cetera. Uh, but are we looking at you know, containing uh, net average price to the rate of inflation, which is in effect no growth? Are we looking at continuing the trajectory of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I increases that exceed the rate of inflation. Uh, I, I think those are critical. I think those are critical issues. And the sooner, you know, that one of the things we're trying to accomplish, though Sharon can correct me where I, uh, and when she does, believe her. Um, uh, you know, one of the things we're trying to do with this new planning process is to give our universities a longer planning horizon, some greater stability. Um, because it gets to the point that Jan raised about contingency planning. Contingency planning on an annual budget cycle is really hard to do, but if you have a two-year outlook, it, it becomes easier. So I think this, the sooner we get guidance from the board on where, where we're likely to be, um, and then I think we need to think about what that, how to implement whatever that guidance is, because there is already considerable variation in the, in the price, that our, the, the net average price at our universities, and so, so do we, and we've already gone down the path of not using a one-size-fits-all approach through our tuition policy. So how does that look overall, and how does that get, um, what's, our, what's our comfort with affordability issues going forward, and then how does it get executed in an environment where universities will come forward, presumably, and have different, different approaches? Yeah, I would recommend we have that discussion sooner rather than later, because uh, tuition time comes in April this year, is that? Yes. Right. It's not right before the budget, so. I, I would really urge us to do that, to have that a really thoughtful conversation going forward. Yeah. There'll be expectations, and yeah. we have, to, we have and, to understand how we meet them. And frankly, I think there's a huge opportunity by pushing our process back to position our universities to advertise more effectively what their tuition plans are. You know, to really address some of the enrollment challenges that they're facing, to be able to even just pushing it back three months to April makes an enormous difference. Yeah. It shouldn't be a mystery. I agree. It's part of the transparency. From my perspective on the on the committee, uh, 
my answer to your question would have been that certainly desire is to hold tuition where it is. That we'd love to never have an increase. That's going to take an awful lot of magic. And as, as our chair said earlier, we can't cut our way out on expenses here. So it's going to take a, a lot of effort from what, many areas. Thank you. Thank you. Get back to the vote. All in favor, aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it back to Sharon again. Sure. So the second item um, is the system redesign investment request. And a lot about what we're talking about today is going into this request. And this is a slide you've seen before, so I'm not going to spend time on it. But it's basically the things that the chancellor has said as part of system redesign we were going to do and what we are actually checking off and doing. And so we have some in red that were today, and we can put check marks against them. And, and some of this is to be able to do this request, to say if we're going to make a request for specific line items, from the General Assembly and the Governor's Office that we are doing what we said we're going to do, and if we get the dollars, we will do with it what we say we're going to do with it. Um, so the request is really for our core infrastructure around kind of all of the components that we talked about. Um, and it's to support technology modernization support that we talked a lot about earlier today, the Student Success Center. Uh, we ran projections based on what it would cost by thread and you know what that would look like over the next you know five years. And so I believe that there is a handout um, that is coming. Um, but we are projecting about $100 million is needed to move us and transition us from our current state to be able to support the universities while they're going through this transition over a five-year period of time. <clears throat> so the second item that's before you is that request for the $100 million spread over five fiscal years and authorizing the chancellor in consultation with the executive committee to determine the appropriate amount yeah. because based on based on that implementation plan, based on when things start, the amount may differ by year. Um, Thank you, Lewis. So, so that is what is being handed out um, for consideration from the board. All mine. I'd like to make the motion that the Board of Governors approve a system redesign investment request of $100 million spread over five fiscal years and authorize the Chancellor in consultation with the Board's Executive Committee to determine an appropriate amount to seek for each fiscal year. Oh, you need a second first. You need a second first. Second. Second. I have a second, and she wants to make a comment. <laughs> I have to wait for the second. Um, I... Um, I, I don't think this amount uh, is going to do it. I really don't. You know, even if, and it's a big if, right, if, if, if we were to um, get the legislature to support this investment, um, $20 million a year is just not going to touch everything that we need to touch. And I don't believe it includes uh, a couple of other things that we've talked about in, in previous meetings, um, although I believe one item is co covered in the capital budget, and that is uh, demolition. Um, but it doesn't cover debt relief. And when we talked about university budgets, right, just an hour ago or so, um, we're, we're looking at uh, serious problems for almost all of our universities with regard to that. And you know, four or five of them critically um, uh, this year. So um, I, I just don't think it's 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 the right amount. And uh, I know it, it it seems odd because one would think you know we would have talked about this ahead of time, um, and we did. Um, and I, I know I know you all want to err on the side of of not appearing to be asking for too much, but quite honestly. We can make the case for it, and I would rather make a case for something that's closer to, to what we really need um, to get this done, and that, by the way, does include 
serious help with debt relief, right? Because we, we, we have to start from a position of strength. Um, we, we cannot get this done as, as weakened and continually, continuing to be weakened institutions. Um, so I, I don't know if it's an amendment, and I don't even know if it's a friendly amendment, because I can't remember how Robert's Rules works, but I, I would like to amend this, this motion. So if it's a friendly amendment, you make the friendly amendment to the maker of the motion to ask if he will consider accepting it. Um, Mr. Chair, would you consider a, a friendly amendment to... I certainly would. Okay. I, I, I would move to amend this uh, to increase the amount to $300 million. Um, if we think the time frame needs to still be five years, I'd rather see it be three years, but uh, at, at least I would like to offer the friendly amendment to raise the amount requested to, to three million uh, and to ensure um, that um, as we go forward with this, um, we, we absolutely have the case nailed down that we are going to take to the legislature and the governor. So that would be three three hundred million over a five year period. Yes, I will. I will accept and second that motion. I think you have a member of your board, Mike. Uh, Brad, Representative Roy, did you want to? Yeah, uh, I, I I see where you're coming from. I'm just trying to think, you know, how my colleagues in the legislature would look at this. Uh, some of them might might think a hundred million is a lot of money. Of course, and that's it gonna, is a lot of money. That's going to be a big conversation. Three hundred million almost sounds like just a really, really big number. Over five years, though. Oh, I, I know, but I, I'm just uh, it, it's uh, it, it, it's a lot. <laughs> well, we, we we don't normally get requests that big. Yeah, you know, we get requests from everybody from hospitals, nursing homes, you know, state parks, DEP. Uh, DC and all, you know, everybody that has money in the budget, they, they all ask us for money. They all ask for five or 10 or 20 million, but I mean, th I'm just saying 300 million, that, 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 that's a lot. I, I understand, and I, just let me respond to that briefly if, if uh, I can beg your permission. Yes. And, and then more intelligent people will respond more intelligently, but my initial, my initial response is um, we're, we're, not, we're not making, um, a, a, a random request, and we're we're not making we're not even making a request for money. We're talking about investing um, in the state system, um, and if you will, please excuse this expression right now, a quid pro quo. And the quid pro quo is that uh, we will uh, manage our small enrolled universities. Um, we will. Uh, you know, get costs under control and, and, and work with the um, state faculty union to do that. We will freeze tuition. Um, this has been a case that's been building over a year, so I think of it differently from the point of view of everyone's coming in and asking for money, and legitimately, because all those institutions you mentioned do need more. But, but this is different. This is an investment in, first of all, something that's owned by the state, right? So we're asking the state to invest in itself um, and in it, its, its own assets, um, its own physical assets, its own people assets, its own workforce assets, because that's what we're, you know, trying to produce. So I totally understanding where you're coming from, and, and you're the one who's the representative, not I, um, uh, I, I would say, let us make our case, because I think we, we, we have a, a good one, totally understanding where you're coming from. As a second, I would just, I would just add the thought that it is uh, not just the investment in, in everything that Cindy talked about, it's the investment really in the future of the Commonwealth. That's really what these 14 universities are all about, in my opinion. That's why I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to second it. And, Jan? And yeah, right, because the alternative, it seems to me, would be to be going back every year or every other year and say, well, you know, we kind of ran out of money, we need to ask you for some more. That gets kind of old, too. Then there's a credibility issue about, do these people really know what they're doing? Can't they look ahead a little bit? Um, I, I like the idea of asking for what we believe to be a more realistic amount over whatever time period you think is appropriate. I don't have a good enough feel for the numbers, but um, I, I know that it's... Um, we're starting out from, from behind, so we have to first of all get up to an equilibrium position, and then we have to have the resources remaining to be able to invest in our future. 
Um, that's, that's a big ask. You're right. It is a big ask, but it, it's where we are. Scott, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Um, Impression. I have to get back to Lancaster, so I'm glad we, I have the chance to bring this up. Um, I understand that you're raising the stakes, right, for that for that investment. Uh, Dan's been a, a, a breath of fresh air, and I think he has the attention of a lot of the people under that dome in terms of the ideas he wants to do. Obviously, you're you're seeing historic cooperation between yourself and the faculty, between the system and 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 the presidents. Um, but I also think the system also needs to raise the stakes for a high dollar ask, and here's what I mean. Um, some prior to, to Dan, you know, the self-evaluation of the system, it was very clear that a lot of the people in the legislature were not happy with that and wanted to do their own because there's an expectation of certain issues being dealt with. Um, we've seen problems with the system that we're all aware of being dealt with, not under your control, but avoiding the system through the form of intergovernmental transfers, which falsely create a picture of sustainability, which isn't fair to all these people who are doing the work of trying to make ends meet, and certainly isn't fair to those young people either at different institutions. And then we have the bigger problem, and it came up earlier in, in, in listening to the presidents, I know, uh, Former Speaker Smith brought this up too. The right sizing of the system is something I know with my colleagues, I hear about almost on a daily basis whenever the state system comes up. And we are attempting through the, the means of, through retirement or whatnot, uh, to do that, but we know that's clearly not enough. And in a lot of cases, you're talking to individuals in state government, state government is down thousands and thousands and thousands of employees pretty much since 2012. Thousands. So kudos to you for, for the vision of wanting to shoot bigger and the stakes. My thing is, and Dan knows this, is he's sitting there in appropriations hearings in the Senate or in the House. He knows the kind of questions he's going to get, and a lot of them are in line of what we're talking about. And since certain things are still happening behind the scenes uh, as we wait for other entities to make decisions, um, I think there's a yearning there to support your mission of having an affordable, high quality education. But I think they're looking for the high ticket issues to be dealt with. I'm not saying it's impossible uh, to hit that huge goal of investment to support everyone working together. Um, but I know, and, and you got a little bit of flavor uh, him bringing it up, that's exactly the kind of things they're gonna be asking of Dan. They're saying, oh, so you want this, and we say we have serious problems and we want to start from a position of strength, well, tell me every single thing that this system has done. Have you done everything you could to put yourself in a position of strength? And I think all of us know that we haven't done every, everything that we, we can. And so I just lay that out there. Uh, obviously, I'll be part sitting on appropriations and, and, and being part of it and listen to some of the members uh, throw some of those questions at Dan too, but just so there's that expectation of, uh, of what a lot of the members uh, who are out there are thinking and feeling. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, Tom, thank you. Um, Senator, thank you. Representative, thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I'm going to have to apologize because we have had conversations over the last couple months about a large um, legislative request and the hundred million dollar kept getting bounced around and the five-year number kept getting bounced around and I um, heard that and every time thought it was a hundred million dollars a year for five years and so that was the number I was expecting to hear today um, and that was the number that I was expecting to go to the legislature with and negotiate and show that we have the ability to do what we need to do to earn their commitment to give us that money um, if we're going to ask for 300 million, okay. I mean, that's not 500 million. I think we probably need the 500, but 300 is a pretty good start. Um, but I know that we have to prove our commitment to earn that money and to be awarded that money. Um, and that will require a lot of effort with the governor's office and the House and the Senate and both sides of those offices um, and this board will have to do a lot. We've done a lot, but we'll have to do a lot and even more. Uh, and the presidents obviously know, you know, we'll need everyone's support. Um, 
So I apologize for misinterpreting the numbers that I've been heard. Um, I don't have a vote on this motion today because I'm not on the committee, but I would support this motion tomorrow even at the lower number than I was anticipating. Any other discussion on the committee? Uh, oh. Why did you choose 300 million? <coughs> An excellent question, which I would love to turf to, you know, someone who's paid to answer these questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the, we were thinking um, along the lines um, of, of, of relieving uh, debt as much as possible um, for the universities. The actual um, costing out, uh, I think, Sharon, um, uh, of the investment plan that you described has been done. And that was originally how we arrived at a, a number of, of 100 million. Um, and then when we started to think about um, you know, the, the, the issues around the debt of the universities um, and, and, you know, trying to make them whole, that's what drove up the number, uh, at least, you know, in, in some of our thinking. Any other discussion on the committee? I would suggest we probably take a roll call vote. Is Audrey here? Or? Yeah. Yes. And you should, uh, you Governor Nicole Dunlop. Aye. No, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Or, yay. I, <laughs> Governor Thomas Mahler. Yes. Representative Brad Roy. No. Chairwoman Cynthia Shapira. Yes. Alternate designee Allison Jones. Yes. Governor Neil Weaver. Yes. Governor Janet Yeomans. Yes. Chair Mueller, motion carries. Thank you very much. Interesting and, and difficult discussion. Finally, Sharon, will you walk us through item 6D, the capital spending plan and budget authorization for the committee's consideration? We are almost done. This is the last slide. Um, just going very quickly, this should be a quick conversation. This is the board action to approve the 1920 uh, capital plan, um, which is a part of the five-year rolling plan. Um, we were allotted $73 million for capital for 1920. Uh, when we looked at how we wanted to um, look at the capital plan for 1920, we, um, in conversations with the universities, uh, there was a desire to focus on demolition, and it goes to the need to drive down operating costs that are required to maintain the buildings that are um, either underutilized and should be demolished or um, not currently utilized. And so we uh, have about 900,000 square feet that we're talking about uh, for the seven demolition projects. It's about um, 26 million of the capital that we're looking at. Uh, that, once demolished, that should give us an avoided cost of six to eight million annually for the universities. Um, all the projects that we're talking about are either obsolete space, unused, or unneeded based on current space utilization <coughs> plans. Uh, and they vary in what they are from a house to a residence hall. So it, it really does vary by project, but they are all by the university's um, desire to remove them so that they can reduce their, that operating cost on an annual basis. And then the remaining other projects are really around two for renovations, deferred maintenance, um, a design for a science building, and then additional funding for projects uh, that are furniture, equipment, um, et cetera. So turn it back to Tom. Thank you. As Sharon explained, annually the board reviews the five-year capital spending plan but approves only the current year's expenditures. Based on the information provided on pages 44 to 46, I move that the committee recommend that the Board of Governors approve the fiscal year 2019-20 capital spending plan. I have a second. Second. Dan, thank you. Any discussion on the committee? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Before I turn it over, I just want to back, back to Madam Chair, since we're, we've concluded, I do want to make one observation. In this room of highly intelligent people, I did notice at the break there are only about a dozen umbrellas in the back of the room. <laughs> Not so smart after all. I have one. Madam Chair. 
of turning it back to you. Thank you, and I, I want everyone to know that I, I have an umbrella. I'm one of the, <laughs> just in my bag, you couldn't see it. I, I, yeah, exactly. Both of which I stole from Dan on, on campus visits. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just find where I am in here. Uh, I think we're ready to move these, uh, these committee uh, recommendations uh, to the full board. Um, so thank you, Tom, very much, and Sharon, and um, Rosa, and everybody, uh, and this entire committee uh, for some really tough, uh, really good work. And. Of course, thank you, board members, um, for engaging in the dialogue uh, that we've been having. So um, I am going to uh, take as a group uh, all of the items, which, and I'll name the numbers, except for item 6-C-2, which was the system redesign investment request, since we did not have a unanimous committee vote on that. So we're going to put that aside. And I am going to bundle um, for an action and ask for a motion to move the following items. Item 6-A-1, approval of board policy, university financial sustainability. Item 6-A-2, revision of board policy investment. Item 6-A-3, revision of board policy defining auxiliary enterprises. Uh, item 6B, building a sharing system. Item 6-C-1, ENG appropriations request. That's the regular appropriations request. And item 6-D, capital spending plan and budget. May I have a motion? So yes, move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on those items as a group? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. Any abstentions? Okay. I am now going to put forth uh, and ask for a motion uh, to approve item 6-C-2, the system design reinvestment request. Uh, may I have a motion? I'll make Don't a move. Motion. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Um, is there discussion? Yes, please, Representative Roy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And you know, I, I fully embrace the hundred million that was talked about previously. I really think, uh, you know, my colleagues in the legislature, you know, would go along with that. Uh, the the three hundred million. I'm just afraid that's such a big number that a lot, a lot of legislators won't even, you know, hear what you're saying when you're talking to them when, when the dollar amount is that big. So I, 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 I regretfully am going to have to vote no. Uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate that I really do. Um, is there any other comment or discussion? I, I, I have a question for discussion, and this is a question to the legislature. Um, can you bind yourself to a multi-year authorization? No. So why are we asking for a multi-year appropriation? with a number that might scare people when in reality all we really are asking for is $50 million or $60 million, excuse me, math is not my forte. Maybe we should really only ask for what we're asking for, bring the number down to for what the real year. number is since and they can't give us $300 million even if they wanted to. Um, cause well, we can't find future legislatures. And we, we can always, you know, sort of present it as an investment you know, with it's the first of a five-year, right? It will be a five-year rolling request from our perspective. But at the end of the day, it's a request for next year. That makes sense. Do you want to? Uh, somebody want to offer a friendly? Um, well, hold on, Sharon. I was just going to say, in the motion, it, it it gives you the total dollar, but then allows the executive committee to do the year request. And so, uh, how it's I think worded how it's right worded? now okay. will allow okay. that. Um, to to the reporters sitting in the back, please take notice of what we're saying. Thank you. <laughs> Do we want to say it again, Sharon, very loudly into your mic? Um, sorry. It, the, the way the motion reads, it gives the total dollar, but then has the executive committee authorize the chancellor on an annual basis. To make the request. To make that exact okay. request. So okay. it, I think it does give you the flexibility that you were just asking for, but I would turn that over to the board for conversation. Okay. Representative Roy, does that um, help you? Well, 
how much of the 300 million, how much of it actually is needed in, in the next year? All, All of it, but <laughs> as you say, being practical, if we, at, if we requested 60 million with the understanding, you know, that we're gonna come back, and maybe it's a pilot test for the legislature, you know? Maybe it's a pilot test to say that there's nothing wrong with that, to say, you know, okay, but this is what you're gonna have to return to us, in addition to what we're already doing. You know, that's one way to look at it. Dan? Um, I didn't discuss this with you. No. Um, so, I, I don't have a vote, but I do get, I have the pleasure of sitting in the appropriations hearings and I'm hearing the questions. And in my head, they go something like this. Have you, meaning the system, done enough to um, justify that scale of an ask? Um, it'll go something like this. Have you right-sized to a conversation we had earlier? Yeah, well, show, show me the numbers. Yeah. And now we're talking about February, not five Februarys from now. Um, how much have you done, to President Pinatello's point, in the non-degree credentialing space, which is where the urgent adult workforce need is? Um, that sharing system thing, how's that going? Uh, where are you with that student information services integration? Why is that a five-year plan? Um, So I don't, I don't have an answer. Well, I have to come up with an answer to those questions. But, you know, so in raising the stakes with respect of the ask, we are raising the stakes for ourselves in this grand bargain. And the question is, are we, are we going to step up to those raised stakes? Because now we're not talking about right-sizing in an abstract way over five or six years we're talking about a route march. We're now not talking about shared academic programming, which is something we can think about, we're talking about it tomorrow. It's a pre-planning, planning phase, right? We're talking about having that in place as a matter of some urgency. Are we ready, are we really ready to do that? Um, I don't have, I have till February, I guess, to come up with an answer to that question, but I don't know. Uh, my, my comments were going to be along that line. I, I, I feel like taking serious uh, the things that need to be done in order, that would necessitate this ask, we have, we, we have a financial sustainability roadmap that we can follow immediately. We have an idea if we begin to run, if you haven't already simulated who, how many institutions would be, and began to move quickly to address those specific things. And I think you could show up with uh, adequate answer to that particular question. Um, and I think we got to move down that road very quickly. I, I think we're, we're, we're done approving the tools that we need. There are a few more left, but I think we've got enough to be able to move on a case. I, I, I strongly feel that way, but I don't know what the reservation no, is. I, I think that um, with this ask, we are committed to move forward. Yeah. And, and that's, those, that's going to be, part of your answer is going to be, this is what we've done so far, um, and th this is what has been agreed to uh, happen, in including these discussions about the shared uh, student information system, um, uh, et cetera. Can I add another comment? Thank you. I serve on appropriations as well. Dan, you, you've got it down. In only one year, you really understand what the questions are going to be, unless there's something nationally that breaks on another issue, like a Title IX issue or something of that nature. That could be part of the conversation, too. But an awful lot of work has gone into this, and it doesn't just culminate in an appropriations hearing. And I think you understand that, and the whole team understands that, that work is going to have to be done starting in the next few weeks with the legislature. You have been doing these things, but particularly with the appropriations chairs and the leadership, both in, in the House and in the Senate on both sides of the aisle, to try to give them those answers to those questions that you can't do when you have a red light in front of you and your time is up in 10 minutes, right? So we, I think we have some work to do. I think 
I hear, I feel that we're prepared to answer those questions. It's just a matter of the strategy that we use to do that. I'm prepared to support this. Do we, uh, I, I'm not, I just want to, you know, technically speaking, do we want to talk about um, a friendly amendment to uh, just uh, have a, a one-year uh, request, which is all uh, that technically speaking uh, could be asked anyway? Um, but, you know, when it's presented as a case with the un understanding of, of what the the full plan is. I, I guess we would need some kind of amendment, either friendly or otherwise. Um, so, uh, is there is Andy here or anybody that uh, can answer? Ah, there we are. How how would we do this, Andy? Well, as, as I look at Speaker Smith as well, but I believe it would have to come from the floor of one of your colleagues on the board, and I don't see anyone stepping up to make that friendly. Well, I, I guess, you know, I need to be perfectly clear about where's our highest likelihood of succeeding. So if we go with a one-year ask and put it in the context of, look, this is part of a five-year journey. We think over the course of the five years, we're going to need, pick a number, 500, 600, whatever the number is. But for right now, we've come to ask you for 100 million for this year. Um, could we do it that way? Does that succeed? I'm looking for guidance, because I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking for guidance as well. What, how? Do you want to table this? So there, there's, there's a motion been made and a second. And that motion is right for the consideration of the board. And it, it's up to a board member at this time to decide whether or not he or she wishes to offer a friendly amendment to 300 million over five years at the discretion of the chancellor with consultation of the executive committee. And I didn't read that, that's just that's my said. recollection. Just to clarify, the caveat was still there for the executive council to turn that into a different request, right? Okay. Yeah. Yes, the way the motion. Yeah. Right, there's no annual amount set for even for this year's appropriation no. ask on this piece. We could table it and let the staff yeah, crunch yeah. some numbers overnight. <laughs> All right, so let's do that. Um, I, I guess I will move. Can I move to table it? Andy? I'll, I'll be happy to do that. I think it's always better for someone other than the chair to make those. Probably. I, I, would, I would move that. Uh, while we've been abundantly transparent in our discussions, I think we should table this for a little uh, uh, further consideration till tomorrow. Till tomorrow. Yeah. Have to have an action. Yeah. yeah. We need to have an action on. So I would. I would move that we just table this until tomorrow's meeting. Second. 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 Yes. Okay. All second. Discussion. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, all right, very good. Thank you all very much. Um, we are adjourned for today. Uh, we stand in recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow.